Uh, am I audible? Yes. No. Oh, yes. gosh. Um, I think with what everyone else has said and the justifiable reason that they've given, I would therefore consider myself an academic in training now that they've actually explained because I didn't understand what the, what you meant by training. But now that I actually look at, you know, throughout the whole year and with the things that we have done, um, things such as writing academically, which includes academic writing, um, you know, being able to analyze things, um, being able to write in a way that, you know, involves things in an academic manner. I feel like the word academic is so important and it creates an emphasis, um, you know, that, yeah. So I would say that I'm a person who, or, you know, who is in academic in training. I don't know if um, you're able to grasp that or you, Yes, we were able to grasp that uh, loud and clear. No? Can we get someone else? Uh, hello, Karaboli Cheku, how are you? Nice to meet you. Uh, would you say you're an academic in training? And what does that mean for you? Karaboli Cheku. Karaboli Cheku. Guys, we, we're not biting. Feel free to speak. Okay, it's it's fine. Let me just pick a name that I'm familiar with. It's Kolile, yes. Kolile. Do you say you're an academic in training and what does that mean for you? Sikolile. Uh, and I can say I'm mean, an academic in training. Oh, as they have said, in this year, as we're doing this year, we have been, we have been taught uh, many things like uh, writing academic text, uh, academic readings. Um, yeah, I will answer that later. Can you answer that for us, please? Debuho uh, Butani. Would you say you're an academic in training and what does that mean for you? Thank you very much, school leader. You can mute your mic. Debuho Butani or Zanelem Konza. Can you guys speak with us? Okay, okay, so anyone, uh, Shami, Nonyani. Guys are wasting time, we are waiting. I cannot speak, my mic is breaking. I go, uh, Miss Nonyana, we heard you loud and clear. There, went, there was no break in there. <laughs> okay, is Tabankosi here? Yeah, can you speak with us? Unmute. <laughs> Um, um, I can say that. I'm I'm in academic in training because uh, here at Vids we are being taught to master the 
the curriculum that we are going to be teaching in high schools and in a systematic manner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I say I mean, the knowledge that we are dealing with. Okay, the knowledge that we are dealing with by academic, not just in life. The knowledge that we the academic one, we are being taught how to, to write academically. And yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We, we did not really get that clearly, but it's fine. Okay, yeah. So we. Yeah, uh, people didn't hear you, Van. Speak from here. <laughs> we didn't hear you. Well, I was saying, yes, I agree that I'm, I'm an academic in, in a, a, a training. So to start with, uh, I'm in an academic uh, space or domain. And then the knowledge that we are being taught uh, uh, in this in this domain is an academic do I mean knowledge. It's not just any academic. We are taught how to write uh, academically. See, yeah, such things. So yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, it it takes us really to what we are here about, because uh, once again, it wasn't. Uh, Mr. Makaring, I, I saw your comment from the live. It's not a waste of time. No? Yeah, so you want, you're asking, can we get to the essay? No, don't worry, we're going to get to the essay. Okay, so the session, the session we are having today is a two part session. No? We're going to do academic writing and then get to uh, the applications thereof to how you answer your essay question. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to do uh, both of those. So the first session is what we are calling uh, an academic writing clinic. So we just gonna deal with some issues that you had in your writing. And this is mainly because of um, you wrote your mock assignment and yeah, we, we got some depression along the way, but it's fine. Uh, so we, we gonna just sort out some of the issues that we uh, picked up from your writing so that we assist you guys. And then with regards to students that are not part of the program, but that are with us today, uh, this is also to assist you guys uh, in just sorting out, um, or rather trying to get a stable ground into how do you write academically and how do you then apply the skills that we're gonna discuss in your VETS essay. So that's what we, we, we're gonna be looking at. Okay, now, to, to just start, um, just a brief intro to the students that are in the online platform. I am Mr. Peter Mbuyisa. I am uh, the CEO and founder of Pedagogical Science Institute, the platform that you are in uh, in this session today. Now, you are going to hear more of us uh, predominantly next year. So we just partially launched the program this year. So because I'm not fully on the screen in the camera, uh, there is my picture, that is me. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you guys on campus next year. Okay, so uh, professionally speaking, I work for the university as a residence academic uh, advisor. And this is partially where the program that we are in was born. Oh, welcome, 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 welcome. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's, it's nice to meet uh, most of you and looking forward to working with some of you 
uh, next year as we are going to expand the program to second year as well. Okay. Now, I just have a few requirements for you guys. Uh, please make sure that you have your notebook with you. We're going to cover some core academic writing skills. We're also going to cover... Uh, guys, can you stop talking? You are disturbing me. And then you about dialogue, please. Okay, uh, so, so about that. Okay, so I was saying, please have a notebook with you so that you just take some notes on uh, how do you approach your essay and most, most importantly, how do you uh, approach academic writing. And uh, people online, put, uh, can I just request that you mute your mic when you're not speaking? And then there are icons there in your Teams, if you want to say something, just unmute your mic so that we can uh, hear your questions and your comments along the way. And then the last one is just feel free to ask questions, comment along the session. Um, uh, and, and I'll be very happy to take any question that you may have. Now let's get to the session outcomes for today. So as I said, this is a two-part session. Uh, and that simply means that you are going to be looking at the first part, which is on how do you articulate yourself academically. So by that, I mean, uh, I, I don't mean uh, a conversational manner of communication, but we are looking at an, an explicit academic uh, method of communication so that you, you, you find your ground, you find your personal um, sense of identity into how you write academically. Then we'll also be looking at how then do you apply your, your writing skills in your sociology essay uh, assignment that you have next week. And, and on that part, we're going to be looking at specific contents that you guys will be expected to be looking at. And just a heads up to the students that are part of the program. I, when I was preparing for the session, I decided not to change any example, any contents that we've done from the past few weeks just to reinforce what you've done and apply it in your essay. You get what I mean. I need to apply the sociological imagination to why students protest. So I'm just showing you uh, that we're still going to use the same example so that we, you guys are not all over the place. Because for marking your essay, we, we identified that there are some issues <laughs> there are some issues with regards to uh, your your, your examples, like how you make examples, you move from one example to, a, to another and it, it makes you guys lose the entire idea. So uh, we're gonna stick to one example today. Né? And that's the same example that Vet expects you to talk about uh, from, from the reading that you'll be prescribed next week. And the person un, uh, unmuted, please mute themselves, let me see who's there. Can you unmute, can you mute yourself, please? You're you distra you distracting me, okay. So as I was saying, uh, next week you'll be prescribed a reading by Wilson and Strydom, and it's looking at social stratification specifically on, uh, on accessibility to higher education. And the example we used in the previous weeks was on why, why do students protest? So it's still on the same lines. When students don't have access to higher education, they may, in a way, be affected in some way. So we'll be looking at how do you apply that sociologically and specifically in your essay to try and create a connection between the concepts that you have discussed. So we'll be looking at that. So without wasting time, let's get to academic writing. Now, uh, this is just an easy way of looking at academic writing. Yeah? Now, there is a reason why, then it takes us to the question we talked about, there's a reason why we talked about, are you an academic in training and what does that mean for you? Now, in some of your responses, we established that there are certain rules and certain procedures that uh, in a way, or certain expectations, if I may use that way, uh, that we want from you as academics uh, in training and most of you mentioned some of them. You are, you are taught how to work with academic texts. You are taught how to articulate yourself academically, be it verbally, and the tutorials give you a, a chance to articulate yourself academically, verbally, and most importantly, for your assignment, 
uh, articulating yourself uh, in writing. So that's the method of communication that we use in the academic space. So now we'll be looking at what are some of the expectations that we have for you in, in, in trying to make you uh, articulate yourself uh, in an academic manner. So we have a question up there, it says academics. So it goes back to the first question, are you an academic? And most of you answer that yes, you are academics. Now the question is, what does that mean for you? And what does that mean? It simply means that uh, number one, you are a person or sort of a person who is hungry. Yeah. But you are not hungry for something normal. You are hungry for knowledge as an academic. And how, and your hunger uh, with, with regards to this knowledge is sort of unique simply because uh, you, you are forced in a way to go out and look for this knowledge. So the knowledge doesn't come to you. Uh, do, we, do we get the point? And the picture is a perfect reflection of that. So the guy is uh, sleeping on, on, on a, 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 a dinner plate, right? So it's exactly what we mean. So you are hungry for knowledge. And as you are hungry for knowledge, you have to go out and find this knowledge. So as I said, uh, and, and, and what does that mean then? As you are hungry for knowledge, it means that there are different aspects to the knowledge that are involved. So number one uh, is the self. So your self is involved in you finding this knowledge. Number two is your context. So the context in where you go to find the knowledge is also equally important. And the last one is your psychosocial being. Now we are saying that now we, 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 we mix the mind and your context in you finding the knowledge that you are looking for. And that is what makes academics uh, very unique. Now, let's just build up on our story. Now, again, so you can see the picture showing you a, 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 a brain uh, opened up and someone eating. Now, let's say you go out to find the knowledge, but now it becomes a problem if you're going to find a junk knowledge. And this is what we we'll call a tracing knowledge, if you, if you get what I mean. Now, that is knowledge that is not really useful for anyone. You do it, do, are we still together, people? Yeah, so you go out, you find the knowledge, but the knowledge you found is junk knowledge. Uh, it's like the cold drinks and the sweets that this guy is eating. Now, the question is is it going to develop your academic self? Yes or no? No. Ne? Yeah, it's junk knowledge. It's not really healthy for your brain. So you're not, it's not going to develop you. Now, the question is, is now, what do you do? Now, you need to uh, sit down, introspect with yourself and think about, okay, so this is me. Takes the aspect of the self. This is me. And this is my context. Now, the context that you are at is university. And then uh, you think about, so it's me and university. Pardon? Okay, yes, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll identify that. Please don't say it out loud. It distracts me. Don't say it out loud. I'm going to identify it with time. Don't worry. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I was still saying, yeah. So it takes you back to this aspect of saying this is me and that is the self, right? This is the context that I'm at, that is the university domain, that is the context. And you have to find a way to match the two. Yourself, who, has for, who is from a very foreign background, coming to the academic space and trying to adjust to the systems and ways of doing things in the academic space so that you articulate yourself in an academic manner. And what does that mean? It simply means that you need to get to a point where, remember we said you are hungry for knowledge. You need to get to a point where you discern for yourself to say, so I am hungry. This is the kind of diet that I want. For example, uh, the man here in the picture or the kid is hungry for what? For a beggar, 
yeah, so the person is hungry for a Pegas. They are in the academic space, and, and, and it's largely connected. So now, because you can envision what you are hungry for, then it means that you can go out and find what you are, you, you are looking for. So you are selective in how you try to find the knowledge. Whereas if you were hungry like the man, the first picture, and you're not really sure what you want to eat, uh, you'll end up eating the junk that is there. Because you're going to go to a shop and you find these sweets and they're appealing to you and you're going to buy them. And uh, in, in, uh, in the academic sense, it simply means you're going to go to your readings and you find these points uh, in sociology, it's nice, that are appealing to you and you're going to include them. Uh, but the question is, are they going to be meaningful enough? Yes or no? <laughs> They're not going to be meaningful enough. Ne? Yeah, simply because you go there, you find a nice sentence, it's nice, and it makes sense. I like it, I agree with what they are saying. But the question will be, does it answer the essay question? If it's no, then why is it there, you see? So that's what we call junk knowledge in your essay. You're putting things that are not supposed to be there, simply because you found them to be appealing and nice. And the question is, are you going to get the marks? No, you're not going to get them as because your essay is going to be out of context. So that's, 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 that's just what we are thinking about. Now, the question that we ask then is, what do you do? So you establish I'm hungry and I'm hungry for a beggar. So you're going to go shopping. And where are you going to shop? You're going to go shop in a Google Scholar or in your Canvas a course page where you are given readings. We're going to go shop for this knowledge in your course text, depending on where you want to uh, 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 get your knowledge. Now, a very important aspect of this is that as you get to the shop, you realize that but because you've already established that I'm here to buy, a, to buy ingredients for making a beggar, it simply means that you are going to focus on ingredients relevant to the beggar. Ne? Now, the question is, can you, can you get there and buy uh, some chicken pieces? No, ne? remember you want to make a beggar, is it relevant? No, so it's, it's the same analogy. In the academic space, there are a lot of ingredients you can use, but we are saying that you need to be selective with regards to which ingredients or what ingredients uh, do you need for your meal? So what does that mean? So you are going to get ingredients relevant to the bag, so that those are ingredients. You start preparing your bag uh, in that format. Now, uh, we've spoken about the story of the bag, of course, earlier in the year, and we are fine with it. Now, we, we, we want to look at a different aspect of things to say, now, I, I am preparing the beggar, and yes, the beggar is nice, and it looks good, it's appealing, it has all the ingredients. But we start asking this question, and simply because you've established a sense of identity in the academic space, we start asking you, uh, yes, you've made the beggar, yes, you've used the correct ingredients. And why are we saying they are correct? Simply because they are from academic readings, and they are referenced. But we ask this important question, uh, is the beggar nice to eat? Yeah, something to think about. Ne? Yeah, we've taught you how to make the bag. We taught you the ingredients important for making the bag. But now we are asking, remember you, you were in, you in the academic space, you didn't really know what to do and how to maneuver yourself around. And, uh, that's when we, get, we, we taught you the story of the beggar and stuff. Now we are taking it a step further. Yes, now you are at a position to sit down and prepare your beggar on your own, even without anyone's help. But now we are asking, when the person, uh, uh, you, 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 you or a friend of yours, or the person marking your essay that you prepared this piece of writing or this beggar or this academic meal or this academic knowledge, it's your beggar. Are they gonna say, no, 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 your beggar is nice. <laughs> it's, it's something to think about. And it takes us to the next section of your 
your your your your your your your cycle of some sort. Yeah. So there is the beggar. Uh, doesn't it look good? It looks good, ne? Yeah. But uh, when the person bites through your beggar, are they gonna have that smile, or are they gonna have this frown? So that's what we are asking. Are they gonna be happy to eat your beggar, or are they gonna have that frown? Are they are they gonna feel that? Yes, it's a beggar. It looks good, but it tastes terribly. And uh, and now it takes us to why would it taste terribly? Yes, it, you use the correct ingredients. Yes, uh, you 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 follow it, or rather, you layer the stuff as you should. But now we start asking the question that uh, as you were preparing your beggar, uh, did you buy bread that is fresh? Uh, or did you did you bake your bread in a correct manner if you baked it yourself at home? Uh, did you put in too much yeast, and uh, or did you put a little uh, yeast, or did you put just enough yeast for the for the buns of the beggar to taste nicely? And with the patty again, we ask, uh, did you use the correct meat for the for for, for your patty or? Did you randomly uh, pick up different kinds of meat and you clustered them together and you, you fried the thing and preparing the bag? Again, with lettuce, we ask, uh, did you take the lettuce before it was ripe and ready to be eaten or was it still in the growing stages? Do you get, guys, where, where this is going most? Yeah, so uh, we are looking at academic writing and we're going to use goes back to what I said, we're gonna use the story of the beggar again, but we are looking at it in a different manner. We are looking at, now, yes, you use lettuce, yes, you use tomatoes, but were the tomatoes fresh enough to be eaten? And will that make your beggar nice? Yes, you use the sauce to connect the stuff so that they don't fall apart, but is the sauce nice? Is it too bitter, is it too sweet? Is it eaten? Is it, is it suitable for consumption or not? And if it is not suitable for consumption, you're gonna fail in your essay, unfortunately. You're gonna make the marker have that frown when they mark your essay. And it's important to think about this, especially with a sociology essay, because yes, you will have the knowledge and you'll have a lot to say, but if you are not selective with the knowledge, then it's gonna cause serious problems with regards to the consumption. And the consumption simply means when the person gets to your essay and they start marking it, they are going to be confused instead of enlightened. Because the point of writing an essay is to share your own perspectives or share enlightenment uh, with regards to what you, you've been given uh, to write about. Okay, so yeah, so guys, that. This is just a, 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 an intro of what we're going to be looking at um, in today's session. So it takes us to this important process. Now, so this is the academic writing process. Now, the process has five different steps. The first step says you need to know your topic. Uh, that is the end. So it goes back to the whole story of you preparing your beggar, right? Now we said you are hungry for knowledge and for you to have the right sense of knowledge, you need to determine what meal do you want to have prior before you even start eating the meal. So it starts there, you need to know your topic. And with your essay topic, you need to, uh, with the vets assignment, you also need to know what topic have they given you. And then you also need to, now the next step is, now that you know your topic and what is expected from you, you need to read and research and find information that is relevant to the topic. So in the beggar example, you need to go for shopping. Yes, it's exactly that. You need to go um, for, for shopping. So we are basically at that point uh, of the cycle where the lady is at the shop and trying to find knowledge. So that's the next step. And um, what else do you need to do? Now you, you, you then, now that you have researched and you have the information relevant to the topic, you need to now outline uh, how are you going to order the stuff, order the subtopics 
order the content uh, that answers the question. So uh, that's the next step. You outline and you plan out how your essay will be. So you select what is going to appear in your introduction, what is going to appear in your body. And remember, the body has a lot of paragraphs. So you also select uh, in what order your paragraphs are going to appear. And then you also need to um, then uh, look at what are you going to include in your conclusion and what references are you going to use um, in support of the arguments and the knowledge that you're going to discuss in the piece of writing. So that's, that's the third step. And then in the, the fourth step now is the writing process itself. So you need to sit down and start drafting your entire essay. Now, that involves a lot of things. Remember, we said you need to support your arguments. So you need to be equipped enough to uh, write, number one, in an academically acceptable manner, uh, which simply means you need to know and be fully aware of um, if you're writing a, an introduction, what should appear in the introduction. If you're writing a, a paragraph in the body, the structure of that paragraph, what points uh, should appear in it and how is it structured? How do you reference and, and cite academic scholars in that piece of writing? And uh, how do you conclude and connect the ideas within your paragraph? And the last step is then for you to review and edit your, your piece of writing. So you're done writing the entire thing. You need to have time to sit down and actually look at uh, what mistakes did you make? Where can you adjust? Uh, how you articulated some of the points and how to improve your writing thereof. So that's 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 more or less the next step in your writing. Now let's let's just focus on the first part for now. So the session as a whole, this is basically the outline for the session. So by the end of the session, we should have exhausted what all of the points mean. Yeah? So how do you how do you uh, work with your topic? How do you read and research? Till number five. So we're going to look at all the five uh, sections that we have over there. Okay, so the first step is here. It said, know your topic. Now, it goes back to the beggar story. You are hungry, you are an academic, you are hungry. You are given uh, a chance to work with knowledge. And uh, how are you given that? You've been given an assignment question by this, right? Now, since you are given an assignment question by this, you need to know what is expected from you in that assignment. So Vets decided to give you a, a lot of stuff. They said the topic can be described as a beggar, right? You are given the bag and as a meal that you need to prepare. Now, Vets, because it's a vast institution, it's an academic institution, it also gave you a lot of platforms uh, where you can source your knowledge. Uh, are we fine with that? So it, it, it is relevant to the picture that you see on the title. They, hold, they gave you a whole store of knowledge. Now, you need to do what that uh, emoji or whatever character is doing there. You need to look for knowledge that is relevant to the topic that you've been given. And, that's, and, and, and how do you do that? It goes with you knowing your topic. So this is your essay. Topic. They said, according to Giddens and Satin, sociology can be defined as the study or the scientific study of human life, social groups, whole societies, and the human world as such. And now they gave you a short instruction to say, you must use the course readings to explain what sociology is and how it is able to study individual groups uh, individuals, groups, and even whole societies. And they said your response should uh, explain key ideas and concepts in the definition of sociology, and uh, also outline what micro, meso, and macro perspectives are, and the sociological imagination and agency and structure amongst other aspects. Now, take note of the words there. They said uh, amongst other aspects. Né? which means this is some of the information you should include. They're not saying you need to stop there. For example, you'll notice the question uh, didn't talk about biography and history. Yeah? yeah, and that is something very relevant to you explaining that, right? Yeah, so that's part of the things that should appear in your essay. And it said you should also show how 
these various concepts are connected uh, with each other. So that's the last part, the, applica the application part to show. These are the concepts and this is how they apply. So we're gonna break the essay question apart. Uh, again, as I said, while addressing writing skills that you need to apply as you are doing your essay. So that's, that's what you need to uh, do. And for us to do that, uh, I want us to go back home. Yeah, so we're going back home. So this is where we started with each other. Ne? We started talking about the beggar and I said, think of your essay question as the beggar this time. Yeah, now on the sides of the beggar, you can see that we have different ingredients. Now the different ingredients there represent your essay question section. Now you were asked to talk about sociology, defining sociology. And I believe that is where your essay is gonna start. So we can describe that as the top part of the band in a way. Okay. Are we fine with that? Or the first ingredient within your body of your, of your part. And you, you, you were also asked to look at then how does it assist in us understanding individuals, uh, whole communities or groups, and uh, the entire society. So that's another ingredient within your fraction of the pan, uh, of, of your uh, beggar. So think about it in that way. So the different ingredients here, in a way, represent what should appear in your essay. Now, we're gonna look at each section then of the beggar itself as a whole, looking at then how does it really apply in your essay and how does it assist you in uh, um, assisting with your writing. So now we are at a point where we know what the essay question is. Are we fine with that? We, we are fine, no? Okay, so now let's get to the next step. So we know the essay topic. Step number two in, in, in academic writing is reading and research. So you know your essay topic, now you need to read and research. Now we said your essay topic is like a beggar, right? And your essay is gonna be like a beggar. Now, if you were looking at a beggar, your reading and research will be you going practically to get, okay, so this is my essay. These are the ingredients that I need for me to prepare the essay. So that's your list of ingredients. So that is the reading and research section. Okay, now I have the ingredients. Now, uh, I also need to find a method of ordering the stuff and uh, uh, actually writing or answering the essay question. So for you to prepare a beggar again, you need to have your recipe, right? Your whole, your method of how you start, what you fry, what you don't fry, what you uh, uh, layer with each other and what you don't layer. So you, you look at those different factions. So, uh, for copyright reasons, because we're gonna post this uh, video, uh, this is a recipe from Tesco Real Food, so that's we acknowledge the site over there. Okay, so now you need to explicitly uh, look at how do you prepare the beggar and what ingredients are necessary for you to prepare a nice tasting beggar. Remember that we are looking at yes, you can prepare the beggar, but uh, is it nice for consumption? Or it's gonna make the marker frown when they taste it. So that's, that's an important thing to think about. Now, uh, taking it back to your essay question. Now you were given an explicit instruction to say, you need to use what your course readings. And it goes back to the section that we are looking at. It goes back to the section we are looking at. So remember you are preparing a beggar and if you are preparing a beggar, you need to have ingredients and a method of how to do it. Now, the second step of the writing process is reading and research. In the instructions of your essay, you are told that you need to use your VETS reading. So they explicitly told you that this is the essay question. And for you to answer it, you need to use these specific ingredients. And your, your, your ingredients uh, are your VETS readings. Are, 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 we, are we still together, people? That's, that's the next step in your writing. Now, what does that then uh, mean? So in week one, you were prescribed um, the reading 
student Zaiman a social a, a South African introduction. So you now remember trying to work with ingredients. You now think about what is special about the reading and how is it different from others. In week one, you are given three, right? First one is that one. Student Zaiman a, a sociology a South African introduction. Now in that reading we have a special thing about it. The first one is it gives them the, the most complex definition of sociology. And remember in your essay question, you were expected uh, to, let me just rejoin, I don't know what happened. Okay, so in your essay question, you're expected to give out a clear outline. Sorry guys, can I just take care of this? Okay, so uh, as I was saying, in your sociology um, assignment, you were given a clear outline of what must appear in your essay. And in it, you were told that you need to uh, define uh, sociology as the first step. And I'm saying that the Stuart and, Redi, uh, and, and Zeman reading uh, gives you the most complex definition of sociology. And we're going to look at it later on uh, in the session uh, when we look at, uh, I think, step number four of the writing process. Now, in, in it, you are told that you need to, uh, what's this? You are told uh, what sociology is as a study and what does it really involve. And you were also, uh, it was also outlined, uh, rather clearly depicted what the different fragments of sociology are and how can you then apply them um, in ways that are more meaningful. And here, so can I just get to the reading? Okay, so yeah, these are the readings you're given. So I was, I was still outlining to say, so the student and Zeman reading tells you, gives you the longest definition of sociology. I think it's in page number four, uh, that's paragraph. And then it also continues to explain what they mean by social forces, social groups, social structure, and the other concepts. So I suggest that, you, you make reference to it specifically for uh, this uh, uh, essay. And you, you also were given the guidance and certain uh, reading. Uh, it is also on defining what sociology is. Now, remember the first one, you can use it for your, in your, your definition for sociology. The second reading tells you what we mean by um, society being structured into social groups, individuals, and a whole societies. So it, it gives you an overview of sociology as a study. It even gives you the perspectives that we need to work with in sociology. So that is the reading you use for when you are speaking about your perspectives and, and, and the, the, the categorization of different facets of so society being the micro, the meso, and the macro uh, sociology. And then the last one, which is Giddens, uh, it, it says sociology issues and problems in sociology, a brief but critical. So okay. let me just broaden, broaden it. Yeah. So it says a brief but critical introduction. So if you look at uh, this one, it, it also gives you a sort of outline uh, of what we mean by social, sociology being able to explain how. Uh, society is categorized into groups, uh, um, in, uh, and, and, and by groups, I mean groups being made by individuals, and uh, individuals are therefore affecting global society. It also gives you a sense of outline on, um, it also gives you an outline on how then it does the categorization of groups in society and the problems that individuals will face uh, in a way. Uh, Come, come across as a connected unit when you are trying to understand how society functions as a whole. So it gives you a brief of a historical inquiry into uh, where does sociology as a study come from and what impact has it had over the years? Because the, the question asks you to talk about the impact of the study in, so, in society. So that's, that's the reading you can look at. And then uh, another reading you, you are given uh, in week number two, which is this week, 
you are given the meals reading on the sociological imagination. So that's, a, I think it's, pay, it's, it's, it's like eight pages, if I'm not mistaken. So that reading gives you a clear, explicit depiction of uh, what the sociological imagination is and how does it apply and how do you really uh, use it to try and understand how structure and agency function together in society. So that's the reading you use. Remember, we are on part number two of the writing skills, and that is uh, looking at reading and research so that we just don't, we, we don't lose the point. Yeah? Now, uh, in the last week, which is next week for the first part section of lectures with Dr. Borda, you are given this reading, Wilson Stridom 2017, uh, it says it has the title Disrupting Structural Inequalities of Higher Education Opportunity. And it has the concept great re resilience and capabilities at a South African university. So that one looks at a what sense of, in a way, it's connected to Bandura, right? Where he talks about motivation and stuff and reciprocal learning. So it, it, it puts you at a point where you try and understand. Uh, how does an individual uh, in a university space get to a point where they are motivated to study hard and get good results? And we also think about what uh, social forces does the university itself offer in restricting or, 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 or derailing the student from focusing in their studies. And it, you see, it, it takes us to what we talked about. For example, if you are a student in an academic space, you, you have been given an opportunity to study, but you don't afford fees. So we think about how will that affect your resilience and grade as a student in a university. So it's, it's a perfect reading you can use to show how um, structure agency, uh, your sociological imagination can be applied in uh, trying to look at the connectedness between all of these concepts. So that's, that's the reading you focus on for the application section. So I think, I think it takes care of matters uh, on that part uh, with regards to uh, what do you do on the research section of your essay. Uh, Charmaine, your hand was up. Can I, can I just take your question? Uh, I, I heard that your hand was up. Charmaine? I just wanted to tell you that I cannot see the slides you are posting. Uh, pardon? pardon? I cannot see anything like the slides and stuff. The beggars you're talking about, I cannot see them. Okay, you, you still can't see the slides even now because I reshared at some point. I cannot see anything even now. You still cannot see them? Yes. Okay, uh, we, yeah, we will try and make a, a plan because I don't know what we can do. Uh, I, you are, you're at Sunnyside. Can't you go and be with Abu Zanel or, or Tebu, if I'm not mistaken? Can you, can you just try and move to a different venue if possible? Or leave the meeting and rejoin? Okay. So that, I think it's because uh, yeah, it's Rufile. She's a guest. And then, yeah, every time you take control, while you're a guest, I can't see anything. No, I, I, shared, I shared the slides uh, with, my, with my laptop. That's why I'm, I'm using the Philo's phone. The slides are not shared with the, with the guest thing. It's shared with my laptop. Yeah, please, please leave the meeting and rejoin and see what, what's going to happen. OK, so we. We're going to move on to the next part of the essay.
Okay, so to continue, guys, yeah, so we're going to move on to the next part of the essay. So that is step number three in your academic writing process. That is the outline and planning. So we're going to look at what are some of the things that you think about in your outline or planning, and um, how does that then affect your writing? So remember, in step number one, we looked at uh, the topic itself, what is expected from you in the topic. In part number two, we looked at some of the information you can use. So that is the reading and research section. Now, uh, PSI students, you know, in your course site, we gave you additional readings on the sociological imagination, um, the definition of sociology, and um, the applications thereof of sociology to education. We gave you additional readings on that. Um, in the reading and writing, and in the reading and research section, you can also check out some of those uh, readings. And I, I can just assure you that they are better in, under, in, like it's better to understand them than the vids ones that they gave you. So you can just check them out and they are not too long. So you can, you can, you can look at them. Okay, now step number three, of course, looks at your outline, right, or planning. So this takes us to the general outline of an essay. So an academic essay has this, part it has section one which is an introduction section two which is the body and section three which is the conclusion and i can just verbally add section four that's your reference list yeah? so that's that's those are the sections of your academic essay now in your introduction you are given uh, things that should appear the first one says it's a general statement your general statement is your thesis statement we know about that yeah? so your your hook so that's your hook. So that's the general statement that must appear. And after the hook, you have a thesis statement. What is a thesis statement? It tells you what the essay is about. So it gives us uh, your stance of some sort or your own outlook of what, of, on, on the essay question that you've been given. And then you need to give them an outline of the main point. So we call that a roadmap. So you are, you are generally giving us to say this is what I'm going to discuss in this order. I'll start with this, move on to this and that. And then uh, you need to know, you know that you need to have a concluding sentence and a link sentence thereof. And then in the body, we say the body is the longest section of your essay. Uh, even in the beggar, it's the longest part of the beggar, right? So it, it, it gives you a different defining paragraphs, the details uh, um, that seek to answer the essay question or, or topic that you've been given or that you are working with. And then uh, in the conclusion, then that is where you sum up the entire essay as a whole. Now, you are, you are given on the side a structure of, the, uh, of a paragraph. It needs to have a, a topic sentence uh, with uh, at least three supporting arguments, three or more or less, depending on what we are talking about, and then it needs to have a concluding sentence and a link sentence that uh, takes you to the next part of your essay, right? Now let's look at the beggar then. Now we said your essay is like a beggar. Now look, thinking about the beggar on the screen, you can see that it, it, it in a way, it's a breakdown of the different ingredients that should appear there. Now we say that your top barn of the beggar is your introduction. Remember that. This, the, 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 the ingredients within the barns, those are re represent your, your body, right, of your essay. And we say that the bottom barn is your conclusion and the plate where your beggar is at, that's your reference list. And why am I saying the plate is a reference list? In a way, it gives you uh, in a way, that's where you save the beggar, right? So with the reference list, that's like you are saving to say, this information in this uh, 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 essay comes from all of these sources. So to try and uh, prove and, and, and ascertain that you have valid arguments, acceptable uh, by different scholars, scholars in your academic space. So that's, that's, that's the last part of it. Now, I want us then to break it down looking at what should appear in the introduction, what should appear in the body, and what should appear in the conclusion and reference list. Okay, so let's let's just get to that. 
Now remember I said the introduction is represented by the top band. Can we see that? Yes. Now, what is special about the top band here on the pitch? Yeah, anyone can unmute there and answer the question. So there is our top band. What is special about the top band? Unmute, unmute, and cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna unmute here. You can speak. Speak. Someone was speaking. It's open. It's the same as it. Uh, there was a chance speaking. Can they also speak? Uh, the top one consists of some sesame seeds. Okay, so that's exactly the point. So the top part has some sesame seeds, right? And that is, we, we now think about what's the purpose of the sesame seeds. Um, you can think about the health benefits of the sesame seeds. And but but uh, can I ask? Does it is it gonna make you fool? No. Do the sesame seeds make you fool? No. They have another function. You see? Yeah. What's the other function? Yeah. Unmute. They can't hear you here. <laughs> So uh, they are decorating the, 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 the top band. It will not make you fool. Yeah. Uh, I know. Okay, yes. Yeah, so that's, the, that's one of the points. It's about really the, the aesthetic appeal of the, of, of the beggar. Ne? So some visits are made to make the beggar look nice. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, we are not disregarding the, nu the nutritional value of it, but they don't really make you full. So it it, show, it tells you something about the introduction. So it needs to be appealing to the reader. That's that's something important that you need to note about it. And how do you make sure? So how do you make sure that then uh, your introduction is appealing to the reader? So it takes a lot of effort. And as you can see from the diagram here, now for a, a full on barn to be prepared, the baker, is, whoever is making your, uh, your beggar has to go through some of these uh, steps. Yeah, so it's either you go to the shop and buy it. So remember at the shop, they, they would have gone through all of those steps. Or alternatively, you make the bun yourself. So some people prefer to make homemade buns for themselves. Now, we start there. So remember, you went shopping for information, right? That's, that's how you write, you, you get to your essay writing uh, or, or, or the outline and planning. You went to shop for ingredients. So this person before, that's why I didn't include that part. We covered it already. The person went to the shop to get the flour, the yeast, uh, the water, if they have to pay for water. And, and, and the oil, if you use oil, and the pens and getting the, the, the stuff needed for that all together. And this is just for the introduction, guys. See, so you, 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 you first now have to mix the ingredients together, as you can see in the first picture there. And then um, after they've been mixed together, you need to now se separate your sections of your flour into different fractions. So that can be described more or less as your roadmap. Ne? So it tells you really what the different parts of your essay is about. So when you when we, when we are preparing your 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 pan, you also go through that process of uh, preparing the, the the different fractions of the flour or the dough that you are using. And why is it important? Because you don't want to have a too much dough or a huge a barn, and it needs to be enough. Goes back to this point 
uh, we ask with is your uh, beggar nice for consumption and for it to be nice for consumption you need to make sure even your bun is just the right size not too big not too small just right so that the person who eats it is 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 enough uh, from it so those are the steps that go into it drizzling it drizz, drizzling it with oil putting some sesame seeds on it and then uh, finally baking it taking it out allowing it to cool down before you you actually slot in the ingredients and you can see that the last step here uh, is when you uh, actually cut the bun um, apart into two fractions. So we say the top bun, remember that's your introduction, the bottom bun is your conclusion. Now, um, a symbolism of you cutting it, that is more like your league sentence saying the first paragraph is on this. Do, do we get the point, people? Yes, no. Yeah, we get the point, eh? yeah. So guys, it's, you see, we, we st it's still the beggar that you talked about in January, but now we are looking at the effort you put in, that introduction. So it goes through this whole process for you to cook a bath introduction that the reader is going to be appeased and uh, uh, happy to read. Uh, remember, uh, it's, it's about you finding your, your, your sense of identity in the academic space. And then we also think about, um, we also think about now the specifics to it. So now you've prepared your bun and uh, there is your bun. It looks nice, ne? very appealing. Now, what should really appear theoretically speaking in introduction? We say it is the hook and we say the hook draws the reader's in, uh, attention. And our hook in this diagram or picture is your sesame seeds. Ne? And then we say you need to have a thesis sentence that is basically depicting what the essay is about. So that is represented by the top section of your bun. Eh? The top section of your bun, uh, it represents your thesis statement. So in a way, it's more like the umbrella of the essay. This essay is really about this. This is my stance on the essay. And then uh, it also needs to have a roadmap. Now remember, symbolism of what we looked at, the roadmap is you, is the actual effort you go through in preparing the pan itself. So that is represented by that. And then you also need to have, after your roadmap, remember it tells you what you are looking at. So it shows the order of argument in your essay, the order of description, if it's a descriptive essay, uh, 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 of how you're gonna represent the points or what are the main ideas of the essay. And remember this part, and needs to be in order need to say I'm going to start with this, then that, then that. Yeah. And then uh, at the end, you need to have a link sentence, as we said, people. So this one introduces what the next paragraph will be about uh, for coherence in the essay. Coherence uh, looks at the connectedness of the ideas in the essay so that you, you, you deliver one whole bag instead of in separate ingredients of your bag. So this is very important. That those are some of the things that should appear in your introduction. Now, I'm not wasting time by addressing this. You guys wrote mock assignments without introduction. Yeah, and, I'm, and, 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 and now I'm scared for your VET assignment. And, 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 and it's not the first time. Uh, remember, we did this in block one. In block two, when I read people's essays uh, before you submitted for Pavlov and, uh, no, for, for Piaget and uh, Vygotsky Bandura, some of you did the same thing. You, you, you have an introduction, but it doesn't have all the elements of the introduction. So it, in a way, it affects your marks again, because you're not really articulating yourself academically. So, so that's something you need to note down and take note of so that it appears in your bed's essay. So let, let's, let's move on to the next part here. Next part is the body. Ne? This is the body. Now remember we said the body is made by different paragraphs. Now the different paragraphs must be in a specific, must be written in a specific way. We are academics, we are 
we, we are being trained to be scholars or workers with knowledge in the future. You need to write in a way that is reflective of uh, what's going on. That is reflective of, uh, yeah, what, uh, what's this? Reflective of the skills and certain provisions expected from academics. And what do I mean by that? Yes, each number one, rule number one, maybe you can write it as a rule. A one paragraph, one idea, ne? not one paragraph, five ideas. One paragraph must have one specific idea. And where do you show the idea? You show it in the topic sentence. So the topic sentence is supposed to tell the reader what the paragraph is about. And because you are a, an artist in the, in, in the field of academics, you don't write this paragraph is about, no, you need to find a nice way of putting in your topic sentence. Same applies to your link sentence. Don't say the next paragraph will be about, you know, you don't do that. It will find a smart way to put it and represent it. Yeah, so that's very important to uh, think about. Now, let's, let me just uh, read that part as it is. So this is an, this is from the uh, Shalmas Writing Center, some university in the States. So they are saying that a topic sentence, so that's on the topic sentence alone. It says a topic sentence summarizes the main idea being expressed. So all other sentences in the paragraph further develop and exemplify what is stated in the topic sentence. So the topic sentence controls the paragraph in that it dictates what can and should be included in the paragraph. For example, you can't say in your topic sentence, you are talking about the interplay between structure and agency, and then boom, we see you talking about structural functionalism and symbolic interactionism. You, you see, in as much as, you see, it goes back to this. I remember one Saturday, I said, you must repeat this word with me. Uh, the word was control, you remember that word? said you need to write with control in sociology. And what it means is if you said in the topic sentence you are writing about structure and aging, that is the only thing that should appear in that paragraph. You can't put other things. Yeah, so in a way, it goes back to this. If you write, some of you write paragraphs without topic sentences. And how does that happen? It's when you start uh, having one idea from the previous paragraph going to the next. And if you're gonna assume, okay, I. I don't need a topic sentence because I put it in, in that paragraph. So you see it defeats the purpose. And that is not, now it, it starts not being a academic essay, it becomes something else that we, we can't need. Maybe it's a school essay, because uh, even in the school essay, they told you one paragraph, one idea. So I don't know what you, you start writing on. So, but the important thing is you need to have your topic sentence, and you see that I have a whole slide on the topic sentence. It's important. It drives or gives direction as to what your whole essay is about, or rather or a whole paragraph is going to be about. So that's what you should have there. And uh, we say that every sentence in the paragraph must be related to the topic sentence. You cannot put irrelevant information. Uh, are we fine, people? We get the point. Eh? Yeah, so every point must be related to the, you can't put extra stuff. So why should you do that? It ensures that the paragraph displays unity. And what's an academic term for unity? We call the term coherence. Yeah, so it ensures someone is calling now. Okay, so it ensures that your paragraph has a coherence ne? and cohesion. Yeah, so now remember coherence occurs when you connect different paragraphs in your uh, essay. And then cohesion, that is when you have one main idea in a paragraph and you are connecting the arg arguments with each other. So that's, that's the difference between the two. Yeah? Coherence, one idea throughout the essay. And how do you ensure you have co cohesion? You need to, uh, uh, no, how do you ensure you have co coherence? You need to have link sentences between each uh, of the paragraphs. Now with cohesion, that's when you connect ideas in the paragraph itself. 
Yeah, for example, you have defined sociology as the scientific study of human life and interaction. So uh, uh, to create co cohesion, to show that this paragraph is about one thing, you can start your essay by saying this suggests that, this means that, this postulates that, this depicts that, this articulates that, okay, let me stop. Yeah, so it, it articulates one, two, three, and you state your points. And then uh, if you are gonna cite someone else, you can say, however, uh, setting also uh, maybe disagrees or agrees with Stuart when he says this by showing one, two, three, you see. So you are, you are showing that in the whole paragraph, the points are connected with each other. And as much as they are connected with each other, they have the same idea, same argument. And by co creating cohesion in your, in your paragraph, you ensure, you ensure that your voice as the writer appears because you are, you are showing that you are dealing with ideas from different scholars. So it shows that uh, the writing is connected and not fragmented, and you are looking at one piece of um, idea or idea. So I put in ingredients for the, okay. So I put in idea uh, ingredients for your body uh, of your beggar. Ne? So they are not in any particular order to be specific because People may put one at the top or at the bottom. So I just put all of them. So any one of those things must be uh, your, your first paragraph. Ne? So to be specific, you need to have one specific, um, uh, you need to have one specific ingredient at the top uh, that qualifies as your first paragraph in your um, body. And then you may have other ingredients following up. So a, a normal thing that one will do is to put the Pringles, the Pringles at the top, because they are small slices, so that they don't uh, get, uh, what's this, lost in within the bag. They choose to put them at the top, and we will see that later on. Okay, so that's one part, guys, next topic sentence. Next part then is, yeah, this is the rest of the stuff that should appear in your body. Now you need to have, uh, you had a topic sentence, you need to have a sentence that say, explains what your topic sentence is about. So let's say you say, uh, uh, sociology has been a study that has been of arguable uh, uh, descent over the years. Full stop. Now we know that in that sentence, you are looking at sociology as the study itself. So you are trying to define it. Then you can say this suggests that a lot of scholars have uh, debated on what is the best way to define sociology, full stop. You see, you've explained what that paragraph is about, yes. <laughs> I forgot what I said, it just came now. Okay, it's fine, I'll, I'll try the name. Okay, so you can say that sociology has been a study of arguable dissent among scholars, full stop. And then uh, you can, you see, it's, remember, even the sentence itself is complex because it's a topic sentence. So remember, you need to explain what it means in the paragraph. So you, you can put it like that. So sociology as a study has been a, a, a subject or discipline of arguable descent over the years, full stop. Now, this means that a lot of scholars or academics have uh, argued on the best way to define sociology or the study of sociology in the most meaning way possible, and then you say full stop. So that is you explaining what the topic sentence is about. Now, now you need to now support your explanation. You said scholars are arguing on the definition, and now you, you have to support that with evidence from the reading. So remember step number two, you have read and researched on the topic. So what are you gonna do? You can say, Stuart and Zyman define sociology as the scientific study of one, two, three, and, uh, and explain, and then uh, after that explanation of Stuart and Zyman uh, definition, you can then uh, say, but however, a certain and Giddens and certain definition leaves out certain aspects of the definition, comma, and then you say, he defines it as one, two, three, you quote Giddens and Zyman's thing. And then in the next uh, para, so in the next sentence, you can then show to say uh, from the definition that Stuart and Zyman and Giddens and Seti 
These are the common things about the definition. Then reach your conclusion, which means uh, uh, in co we can conclude to say sociology as a study deals with one, two, three. You see that? So that's your concluding, <laughs> that's your concluding uh, sentence. And you can say, um, in as much as we can say sociology is uh, 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 sociology as a study, uh, okay, or you can say, okay, it, it has been depicted that sociology as a study is of complex nature. It is thus important to uh, look at what fragments of society does this study uh, does, does this study look at? And you say, full stop, that's your link sentence. We know that in the next paragraph, you are looking at, um, you are, you are looking at the different fragments of society that sociology as a study uh, looks at, you see that? So we know that you're gonna now look at how does sociology study uh, micro society or rather individual relations, group relations and uh, whole societies. So you have a paragraph on that and also explicitly look at that those perspectives are known as the micro, the meso and the macro perspectives and they have names or theories uh, that go with them being your structural functionalism, symbolic interactionism and your conflict theory. So don't worry about content, we'll get to it. Ne? So I'm just showing you what should appear in your paragraph. So that's how you support your arguments and order your arguments in the paragraph. So from that, you have explained your topic sentence, you have supported your explanations with evidence from the readings to show that different scholars define sociology in different ways. And you show that explicitly in your definition. And a, a very important thing now is how you reference. People still don't know how to reference. Now, people, if you're gonna, there are two ways, remember, there is a paraphrase and there is a direct quotation. A direct quotation has a page number. A paraphrase does not have a page number. Ne? Yeah, so direct quotation, you have your surname of the scholar, the year, the page number, there is an example. So I put in Radford room, that's that. So you have Radford 2021, page three. So that's a direct quote. And remember that you need to use your inverted commas yeah, for a, a direct quote. And uh, in that sentence, the full stop comes after the reference, not before the reference. If it is after, if it is before the reference, you mean that that uh, reference is for the following sentence, not for the one you directly quoted. And it will mean that you have plagiarized, uh, you did not cite that direct quote. Uh, are we fine, people? Yeah, so Tenedin is gonna mark it as, a, 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 as plagiarism. So you need to cite uh, correctly. And then now there is also a paraphrase. You say the paraphrase just has the surname and the year, that's it, Radford 21. 2021, so that's that's it. Now, remember now, you'll find a situation where you have uh, Giddens cited in Stuart and Zeman. So you need to put it clearly to say, Giddens as cited in Stuart and Zeman, and you put in the year as the Stuart and Zeman and the page number where Giddens is cited. You don't, you don't, you don't put in Giddens and the year if you haven't read, uh, Kidding's readings uh, himself, because we won't know the exact uh, page number. Uh, are we fine, people? Yes. Okay, so that's what you do. Uh, when you're supporting, that's how you reference. Uh, very important. Uh, even, even people that say we've mastered a bag and we are fine, even second years, guys, even uh, fourth years, drag, still struggle with referencing. So you need to master this. And the only way to do it, you need to practice. Yeah, so that's how you cite. And, there are complex other ways on referencing. So that's that we that we look at. Uh, when we when we give you feedback on your essays, you'll see some of the suggestions on other ways to reference, but these are basic ones. For a paraphrase, you do this. For a direct course, you do you do you do this. There are other complex ways of doing it that are outside this. So you just uh, with those ones, you learn them with time. And we, we're gonna comment with some of them in your assignment submissions, no? Okay. Uh, okay, and then the next part says you need to then explain your code. Remember, you cannot have subsequent co quotations. You can't 
reference toward next next sentence you are referencing kiddings and next sentence you are referencing uh, who's this guy and uh, meals you can't you can't do that guys you can't do that yeah uh, you cannot do that it's not not allowed <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it is not allowed to reference because if you do that you you are basically going to be having subsequent references and it means your voice is not appearing because you just wrote her, it basically wrote us a summary of these three readings. You are not showing us how are they connected, how are they uh, answering the essay question, and how are they supporting the topic sentence. It's just references, and then that is not allowed. You're not going to get marks, unfortunately, if you're going to do that. Yeah, so just, just take note of that uh, when you are writing your essay. And then again, you, you then. So, okay, the, here, here's a point just on the side to say, when you are explaining the quotation, you need to show how the quotation or citation you use is relevant to the topic sentence. You, see, you, you show how does it assist in uh, extrapolating what the topic sentence is about. So that's the point of uh, explaining it, which means if you have subsequent references, you are not really showing how is it connected to the, to the topic sentence? And if it is like that, it means your paragraph has uh, no cohesion at all. It is vague. It's a, it's a silent paragraph with no cohesion at all. So it's important for you to take note of uh, this point. And then um, again, then again at the end, you're gonna have. Remember, you can have more than one supporting uh, quotations or ideas. And then afterwards, you need to have a concluding sentence that sums up the entire argument and a link sentence that introduces the next paragraph. And why do you have a link sentence? Again, it is for coherence, for creating coherence in your essay. Okay, so that is the last two parts. Né? You need to have a concluding sentence and a link sentence for coherence in your essay. Okay, so I'm going to take questions on the body before we move on. Okay, so before we move on, I'm gonna take that. So if you look at the diagram over there, guys, it is a beggar and it looks very appealing. Né? Yeah, and you can see that it has uh, sources spilling out very connected together. Né? So if you follow all of those guidelines, that's how your, par your academic paragraph will be. A connected piece of a beggar that works together instead of fragmented ideas that are not nice to taste uh, in terms of academics that are not nice to read because we won't really know what is this guy talking about. So remember, get your control in writing. And for you to have the control in writing, you need to uh, follow the academic uh, writing um, provisions that we have for writing a an academic paragraph so it always has to be in that in that order doesn't matter if you're writing literacy or bat or whatever if it's an essay at vets or any other institution it needs to follow those guidelines always even if it's a tutorial task people and tutorial tasks are designed to assist you practice on your writing yeah and then let's look at the last part of the uh, of your structure or body. Remember, this is the part on the outline of the essay. Yeah? So outline and planning. So that's what you need to have. Now, in the conclusion, we say that the conclusion sums up the main points of your essay. You can never ever number one have a reference in the conclusion, because it means when you have a reference, you have to explain the reference, and it means now you are adding new information to that paragraph. And it means now it is not an introduction, it's not a conclusion in that case. You can't have a reference in the conclusion. You need to sum up the main ideas of the, of the essay. So in that case, in the conclusion, in a way you restate your, your thesis statement. So you show us, uh, did you manage to uh, fulfill the, or rather get to the answer of the question in your essay? So you can say in conclusion, my essay has attempted to depict that, or rather to define sociology uh, in, 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 in the simplest and complex ways possible in trying to show 
how is it useful in, uh, in, in assisting us uh, in understanding so how society is structured uh, from individual group and whole society and you say full stop. So in a way, gives you as a, a thesis or an overview of what your essay was about. And uh, you, 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 you need to re-emphasize then the main points that you made after that sentence. The first one in a way must be more or less related to your thesis statement. So you are showing us, were you successful at uh, fulfilling your, or rather getting to the expectations of your thesis statement or not? And you also tell us then how were you successful by restating some of the main points that you made in your essay? So we have in bold, in capital letters to say, you do not introduce new ideas in the conclusion. So this one should give us general statements. Father, you need to give us general statements about what your paragraph was about. So that's very important. Okay, and then let's get to the last part. So you save your paper in a plate, right? You don't save it in a table, you save it in a plate. And I said your, ref your reference list is like the plate over there. So the reference list tells us where you got the points from. But now an important thing is the style that you use. So you need to use APA referencing style uh, in your uh, in your reference list. If it is not like that, again, if your if your referencing styles conflict in your essay, that is going to be marked as plagiarism because your your in text reference and your uh, uh, reference list don't go in line. It's more like you are um, it's more like you are uh, using different ideas or you lied about the references that you use. And you always need to make sure that the in text references that you use. Uh, uh, colorate or complement the reference list that you have. So if you, you can't have five in-text, uh, five people in your in-text references, and then you have four re uh, references in your, in your reference list. Yeah? So it's very important to take note of that. And then uh, this is just the format. You need to start with the authors and then move on to the year of publication in the buckets. Uh, take note that even the commas and the full stops count, uh, very important. So you have the surname, you have a comma, you have the initial. Next to every initial, you need to have a full stop. Ne? Yeah, so you have the surname, comma, initial, full stop, then comma, it needs to be there because there is another person. And then the end, you don't use A N N D. For end, you use the abbreviated end in your reference list. And then you have another person there, Pevin, which is the surname, comma, uh, 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 initial, which is L. Since the person has two initials, uh, you have a full stop in between. Yeah? So you have L, full stop, A, full stop, comma, and then you have an open bracket for the year, 2017, those brackets, then another full stop, then you have the title of the book, because this is for a book, and uh, the subtitle of the chapter that is being referenced. And then in brackets again, so remember the subtitle is always italicized, as you can see there. And then you, you have in brackets the edition. So if it's a book, in the, in the books always have editions. This is the 13th edition, and it's in brackets. You need to have a full stop after the closing. Um, uh, bracket, and then you have the publisher. So you have Wiley, that's the publisher, and a full stop at the end. If it is not in that form, it is marked as plagiarism, and you are going to be penalized for that. So Tenidin is going to even, I'm, I'm pretty sure from the June exams, you show, you saw that, like some of you saw that. Tenidin does even cite, uh, what's it called, a reference as, as plagiarism. That's mainly because the reference is not in the correct format. And if it is like that, you are penalized for that because you plagiarize basically. Yeah. So it's important to articulate yourself in an academic format. So uh, that is that. These are just different methods then of how to do it. Now we were looking at a book. Ne? 
So this is a channel. We have different things we use. We have a channel, a book, chapter, and for a book as a whole, let's say you are not referencing a certain chapter. So that's how you, you cite the different stuff. And what's the difference? The difference is that with a journal article, the, you, see, you, you see we did not italize the, the, the title of the paper. Ne? Can we see that? So that's the difference. The journal article has no italics in the, in the subtitle and the title of the journal article. And then the reflective practice, that is now the, in a way the book or the set, the set of a journal volume where it appears from. So that one is italized. And then uh, afterwards you, are, you, you need to cite in which volume does it come from and when was it published, uh, as you can see there. And then with the book chapter, we showed you in the previous slide how you do that. And then with a book itself, uh, you italize both the book name and the chapter that it comes from, as you can see there. And uh, remember at the end, you have your publisher for, 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 for all the three things, except for a journal article. Yeah? Are we fine, people? Journal articles don't have publishers at the end. You can see that the last thing there is the volume details, yeah? the first one on journal article. But for the book chapter, you have Springer, and then you have Harvard University Press. So at the end, you always have the publishers themselves. Uh, so that's, that's, that's how your reference list should appear and should be designed. Last time I taught, I, I taught you how to cheat the system. I mean, yeah, so you go to Google Scholar, you search for the reading they gave you, you go to APA, you copy the reference as it is, and you paste it in your, in your reference list. Okay, now can I, can, can I ask what is special about the references that you see here? Something that you guys never do. Look at the reference list, there's something different that you guys never do. Okay, yes, they need to be in the alphabetical order. I always put them in alphabetical order. There's something that you never do. It's in your eyes. You need to what? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you, you remember your... You remember your, your division in, in, at high school? Long division, people, do you remember long division from high school? Yeah. From primary, ne? you had you had that thing. You called it what? A car. Was it a car? What did you call it? Yeah, you it passed, yeah, whatever you called it. So you need to make sure that all your references are in that form, ne? Yeah, so it silako should be appearing over there, people since you are calling it that. Yeah. So you you need to you need to be able to indent your references so they need to be indented so they need to be in that form yeah so you click on okay i'm gonna show you I, I put in a slide on the features that you need to click on on how to do that you can't submit references that look like a paragraph people they need to be indented they, they need to look in that format you know? okay so that's that's something to think about Okay, so in summary, guys, that's how your, your planning should look like. So you have a beggar in that sense. Introduction is your top ban. It gives the context as to what the essay is about. It describes, uh, uh, it, it describes what your, your standpoint is on the piece of writing and how you are going to order your arguments. The body, gives content as in, in terms of uh, supporting what your thesis statement was about. The conclusion summarizes the entire essay and that is represented by your bottom barn of your essay. And the reference list is represented by the plate and it gives you or gives us a list of where you, you took the points that you were addressing. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is that is what we have ne? for step number three. Uh, can we take a five minutes break for content? Yeah, so this is for content. The, point number four is the actual essay itself. <laughs> yeah. 
can we can we just take a five minutes break uh, when with the students that are in the online platform we're gonna take a five minutes break so we're gonna resume five minutes to four so we're gonna address the sociology content itself that should appear in your essay
Okay, we are back online. Just a sound check again. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, people. Where, where, what happened to people? Yeah. Five minutes is 10 hours now. Okay, it's fine. They're gonna find us on the way. Let's just resume the live. Just, just a moment. Okay. To the students that are joined online, can you join the live again just so you 
you will see what's happening on the venue. So this section is very theoretical. So we'll be looking at sociology content itself and what should go into your assignment. So it will be very interactive. It will be good if you just see who is speaking from the student side in the venue and follow through with the conversations in here. Okay. And then again for for alternatively you can type your questions in the chat section of this meeting. I don't know if you guys have access to it. So we will resume the session itself quarter past four. Just wanna wait for you guys to join in. <laughs> So remember the handle is pedagogical underscore science underscore institute. Insta handle again is pedagogical underscore science underscore institute. Uh, we're starting got a pass. Got a pass.
Uh, once again, we're gonna start Coda Pass. We're just gonna wait, to, wait for you guys to join the live and for students that are in the contact platform to rejoin the session. <laughs> Okay, so in the meantime, can you guys drop your content questions in the chat section? You can drop your content questions, sociology content questions in the chat section. Yes. Um, at approximately what time is the session ending? Uh, approximately quarter past five. We just need an hour for the last part of the content. Um, okay, so I'm just going to send the mats um, because I had a session at five for mats and I wanted to go get my supper. So okay, I'll just inform the I'll just inform the mats tutor that I'll be fifteen minutes late. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are starting in 30 seconds. Can you switch on the sound? Okay, um, hello, hello, people, hello, let's come back. Yeah. Okay, so welcome back to part two of the session. Okay, so we are back to part two of the session. We are looking at uh, the essay content itself. So in our cycle, it serves as part number four, and that is the part that says starting your writing. So in the starting your writing section of the essay, that is where you actually focus on the content itself that should be reflected in your essay. Okay, 
So now remember, just to recap, we had already described what your essay topic is. We've already shown you how to read and research what is expected of you and what should be reflected in your piece of writing. And we've already outlined and planned for the essay in terms of how are we going to structure the paragraphs, how are we going to represent the, the points in an academically acceptable manner. Uh, so we've, we've reflected all of those fractions of the essay. Now we are going to look at uh, what do you do then when you start writing your essay. So you actually explicitly focus on the content. And what is the content? It takes us back to this part. The content is what your essay question is asking you to talk about. So it says, uh, to recap, according to Keaton's and Setin, 2017, page four, sociology can be defined as the scientific study of human life, social groups, whole societies, and human world as such. And you are given instructions then to say you need to use your course readings and explain, number one, what sociology is, number two, how it is able to study individuals, groups, and whole society. And in your response, you need to take note of the following guidelines. Number one, you need to explain key ideas and concepts in the definition of sociology. So you are expected basically to give an extended definition of what sociology is. And then you are expected to give us the micro, meso, and macro perspectives as, uh, uh, as, as explained by sociology as a study. And you also need to give us an, an outline of what the sociological imagination is and what micro, meso, and macro perspectives are. And then uh, lastly, you need to show how all of these concepts are interconnected to each other. Remember, the section we are on is starting your writing process. So we are going to look at the specific sociology content. So if there are sections of your um, slides from Dr. Border that you don't understand, uh, please drop your questions in the comment section on the live and also in the comment section on the Teams uh, meeting or use the range to your hand icon to uh, give us your questions so that we address the issues. So this part is a uh, part two of the session. It is looking at the specific content that should appear in your essay. Okay, so let's get to it. Now, we will break the question into fractions and address the content as we move along. So uh, as you can see in that part, we have the bolded, bolded section. It says use your course readings to explain what sociology is. So that's what we are looking at now. Basically, it's the first paragraph of your essay. Okay, now our tutorial started here. We were analyzing sociology, we remember that. We were analyzing society, I'm sure we'll remember that. Now, we, you were asked to look at the picture on the screen, in the previous tutorial content session we had. Uh, which was, uh, I think, that other week on Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. So you were asked to look at this picture and you were asked a very important question to say, what do you see from this picture? The direct things that you see from the picture. So we're gonna change the approach today to say, if you were a sociologist, what would you see from such a picture? So there's a difference between how you will look at the picture as a normal citizen and how you would look at it as an academic or a sociologist. So I want us to make that distinction. And also look at then how does it assist us in defining sociology as a study. And it also is gonna guide the kind of examples you're gonna use when you are trying to explain what sociology as a study is. So I'm open to taking in questions, uh, responses from the online platform and the contact platform. So guys, what do you see from the picture? And specifically as a sociologist, what would you say you see from the picture? Uh, good name. Eh? Mr. Peter, I don't see the picture. 
Okay, you don't see the picture. Can have you been in the meeting the whole time? What what happened? I've been in the meeting the whole time. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if I can do anything about it. Okay. So in the meantime, students in the contact platform, can we speak? Yes. Pardon? You wanna respond? <laughs> You want to ask about this, about yeah. something else, yeah. about this or something else? No, you can uh, get a phone somewhere, someone who's in the meeting. Yeah, you need to ask so that they hear you. Guys. Then you can ask after the session, my man. Yeah, because it's, I hope you understand, I'm conducting the session, it's not the other way around. No, <laughs> it's not personal, it's sociology. Hence, I'm saying, ask, uh, uh, please get, get a mic so, you, so they hear you in the online platform. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So guys and students in the online platform, can I request something? That's a simple thing. This section is theoretical. I'm going to ask you to comment most of the time. Make sure someone is in the meeting. Can you join the meeting, man? Because, man, you see, waiting for a phone that is that side. And you have a phone there. Nah. Yeah. And, uh, let me. Uh, come on. No, I wanted to ask about the ISA Kuti. When we write the essay, you write in the context of uh, the society of like different yeah. societies or <laughs> okay, uh, uh, guys, can I just remind you, I, I guys, guys, this is like the fourth session in the contact. I told you, just hold the phone and speak up. Yeah, I'm speaking. Yeah, now. don't speak here. So they also uh, need to hear you here. Oh, yeah. Speak as if you are not holding a phone, so they hear you too. <laughs> no, I'm asking, Koti, like, if we're the, the, the way we write the essay, do we write sociology in, in context of school or in context of, like, every, everything, like, in South Africa? We look, do we look at South Africa as a whole, or do we look at school as a society? No, that's what I'm asking. Like, if, you, if you're going to give examples, like, for instance, I'm going to give the school related examples, or you're going to give uh, like South African society examples now? <laughs> okay, so to answer the question, um, the, the response is in your essay question itself. No? Yeah, the response is in the essay question itself. Uh, you were asked to, there's a part that says, use the course readings to explain what sociology is, and how it is able to study individuals, groups, and even whole societies. It, they did not say even education only. Ne? You're looking at society as a whole. Are, are you fine? Yes, you are. You're looking at society as a whole. Are you, are you answered? Yes, yeah. So the instruction is in that. Yeah. So, guys, uh, in a way, there is a two part two part way you can approach this. In defining sociology as a study, you are forced to be general because it's, it's a general definition. And then when you are looking at how these various concepts are connected, the last part, yeah, it will be wise for you to just use the prescribed reading, the third one, and show how the concepts are connected in the context of education. Yes. When you're showing the connection between concepts, you can use education because you have prescribed the reading specifically for that. But in the definition section, you are forced to look at what we are looking at in the picture, general society. Yes. Okay, you guys have rejoined. I'm still seeing the same number here. Head of the table, are you in the meeting? Don't have Wi-Fi. 
Okay, guys, someone there at the back must join the meeting. And where Mr. Situme is, can someone join the meeting? Are you on the meeting? Okay, so you'll use his phone. Okay, and then La Payana, what's going on? Do you have someone in the meeting? Do you have someone? Leabon? Hey, you're busy with meetings there. Are you, is there someone in the meeting there? Okay, someone must join them because you're wasting time. You're wasting time. Okay, so let's let's continue, guys. So we have a picture here. Can we talk? Um, as a sociologist, remember last time we were general about it. You are a sociologist, you are asked, what do you see in this picture? How would you answer that question? And how you answer that question uh, determines how are you going to write your first paragraph. Yeah? <laughs> and we're going to see how, how, how. Why am I saying so? So let's talk. Yes. Okay, Rene, yes. You're a sociologist, you're asked to look at that picture. What do you see? You are a sociologist, you're, you're asked to observe this picture and tell us what, what, that, what do you see and what does it mean for you? Yes. And people in the online platform can hear you. I can't hear you here. I can't hear you here. Uh, unmute there. You, you are, we can't hear you in the online platform. Oh. oh yes. I, I can Okay, I, I repeat again, you are a sociologist, not a mere citizen in society. You are asked to observe this picture and tell us what you see. I don't understand. <laughs> yes. What part of the question don't you understand? The question is clear. You are a sociologist. You are given this picture to analyze. You tell us what you see from your analysis. Yes, you are, and now you are forced to apply. Remember, there is a special way of looking at things in sociology. You use your sociological imagination, number one. And in your perspectives, you apply that in analyzing the speech. Yeah, and if you can't do that, then it means you don't know what sociology is. Yes. Yes, Mr. Rene, make sure that they hear you. Yes. Uh, Mr. We directed our attention to you. You can't say you'll answer the next one. Should have said that from the start. You are wasting time. Yes, let's hear. Let's hear. And and what I know is you know what to say. So you have the answer. Let's hear. Yes, you have the answer. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Matsane, let's hear. Oh, and yes, students in the online platform can also assist us. You can just raise your hand and see your picture. Yes. I see social structures. Okay, so you see social structures. Yes. Uh, that's, social yes. Institutions. And social institutions. Which institutions will be specific? Maybe I can say that Vodafone uh, company there falls under which social institution? 
That's why we gave the that's why we gave you the name freshman class. <laughs> yes. Economy. Okay, in economy, ne? Yes. Okay, so that's that's the social institution it falls under. So he says he sees social structures and uh, there is a Vodacom tower and a telecom tower, and that is depicting uh, social institutions that fall under the economy. Can we get more ideas? Yeah, so Rene, you see, you know the answer. Don't you see this thing? That's what I mean by saying you are a sociologist, you're observing this. What do you see? Yes. Okay. I see it today and um, those structures for economy. So uh, that city renders more services to the society. Many people are, are more likely to be found there. Um, and high concentration of people that would lead to uh, less job opportunities since there are many people and they follow services there, right? Yeah, if they follow services, there are prostitutions like it found the drug companies, etc. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so that's that's part of what we see. Yeah. Uh, can we get one more comment, Mr. Tevin? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can just pass the phone behind you, Tevin. Yeah, please go. Yeah. Um, from what I see on that picture, that I I see first of all I, I can see the building that in a way are assembling the same height. Yeah, you <laughs> that sound is distracting here. You laugh, you laugh. Yeah. Yes, Mister, we are listening. Pardon? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yes, yes, I feel it. Yes. can't hear you. From the picture, CJ, as he mentioned that the, there's um, services going on in there. I see different structures, business structures, which are economic. I see institutional structures like education. There's beds somewhere there. There's a rest somewhere there out there. So, yeah. There's a place, there's an apartment for a, an upcoming teacher somewhere there, like my sister. There's a, yeah, there's just a lot of things going on in there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so thank you for those reflections. Yeah, so guys, you see, you were put, you were put in a tight spot. Uh, and I'm gonna use Renee as an example. Hey, I do. <laughs> Not to say high school, my guys, come on. Okay, uh, yes. So in, in a way, you were put in a tight spot to say, uh, we, we didn't ask you what you see from the picture general. We asked if you were a sociologist, which you are, uh, what, or, or how would you analyze what you see in the picture? And uh, you use certain concepts and certain weights and identified certain things that will be uh, hidden from a normal uh, uh, outlook of a, of a person who doesn't do sociology, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. So you, you are put in such a tight spot to try and tell us what you see from a, a, a professional standpoint, so to speak, yes. Yes, I was asking, um, can you distinguish between social situation because sometimes I fail to like distinguish between the two. Is there a school 
a structure under the institution of education or is it school an institution which could make structures like teachers learners and stuff okay yeah so that's 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 a nice question it's it's it takes us to this part of things just a moment yeah so it takes us to the definition of sociology ne? So according to uh, Stuart and Zyman, and uh, he, there's a part where he talks about social structures. So he says sociology is, can be defined as the scientific study of human social interactions and social forces which shape much of human behavior. So sociology studies the patterns, the trends, and forms of collective social action and the social processes and structures. Um, in society, which arise out of the way human beings act in the world. Okay, so just some hidden curriculum matters. Take note of how I reference this. You need to reference it in that way. And you'll notice before the open quotation mark, there is no comma. There's a reason why it, there is no comma, because it's more like a continuous sentence. Ne? Are we fine with that? Okay, so going back to the definition itself. So we are saying that uh, you need to give an extended definition of sociology. And um, what do we mean by that? So guys, this is the part where you take notes. So we say, number one, sociology is the scientific study. I'm gonna get to your answer. Yeah? Sociology is the scientific study. Now, what do we mean by it being a scientific study? It means we use this, uh, certain scientific processes and what do they involve? They involve us making observations in society. It starts there. We make observations in society and from the observations in society that we make, we ask certain questions about why are things structured the way they are? How, how, why are things organized the way they are? Why do people act the way they do? So that, that is the next part of the scientific process. And what do we do then? After asking those questions, we try to hypothesize and make uh, uh, assumptions as to why things are organized in the way they are. And uh, after doing that, we get to the, um, uh, the, ex the, the research process. Uh, in science, it will be experimentation, right? But in, since we are working with humans, we don't experiment on humans. So you would say we start now our scientific inquiry or research. And it, it is divided into two. It's either through qualitative research or quantitative research. And uh, what does that mean? So we start making surveys and, 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 and getting how many people maybe are found in that uh, CT. And uh, out of the people that are found there, how are they structured? How are they organized? How do they interact with each other? And after we get there, we then uh, look at quantitative research, which ascertains the theories we make. So we approach specific people and we look at uh, the quality of the data we've collected to say uh, how many of the people that we've studied face certain issues, how many of them are not affected by some of the issues we are trying to study? Uh, why do they interact the way they do and what influences their interactions? So that's what we mean when we say, this is a scientific study. Uh, and, and, and after asking or surveying like that, we get to a point where we, we, we then um, make certain conclusions to say, so based on the research and evidence we have collected, these are the common interactions found in society. These are the common uh, 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 traits and trends and patterns that exist within society. And then it, it, we are then able to have our sociological theories or perspectives uh, that, that we categorize into three uh, in, us, in assisting us uh, to get how society is structured. So that's what we mean by sociology being a scientific study. So when you are explaining, remember the essay question asks you to explain what sociology is. So in your explanation, you need to make a, 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 a reference to how people are structured in the individual sense, in the group, and in the macro 
a society, societal sense. And uh, how do you do that? You, you, you look at um, the specific structurization of people uh, within society. So that's what we mean, people. We need to uh, take note of that. By the scientific study, remember you're giving a, an extended definition. So you tell us what does it mean to say it is a scientific study. Simply means it applies or follows certain scientific processes in the collection of information or knowledge. And then it continues to say, uh, it's the scientific study of human social interaction. Now, this is the part uh, uh, that answers the next part of the essay question. Eh? So when we are saying it studies human social interaction, we ask the question, how are people interacting with each other in, uh, in an individual to individual basis, in the group basis, in the global societal basis? So that's, that's what we look at. And it takes us to uh, how the study itself is structured. So it is structured in a way that enables us to understand how groups of people uh, uh, um, interact with each other and functionalism as a, a sociological theory or perspective is used in explaining how groups of people are, 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 are interacting with each other. Because we say within those groups, there must be a state of equilibrium or what we call value consensus, as you will do with Ms. Kibel from week number four of the block. And we also think about now how do individual to individual people interact with each other? And we use the perspective social, uh, uh, what's the symbolic interactionism as a perspective in explaining how individuals interact with each other. And what do we look at in symbolic interactionism? We look at what symbols a common, so it goes back to the concept of trends, social trends that we look at. We look at what symbols are common within the specific group of people or within these individuals. Do they share the same language? They share the same language. How does it then allow them to interact with each other successfully? Uh, we also think about, are they from the same culture? Are they from the same religion? Uh, 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 are they uh, related with each other in, a, in, a, in what's this? through bloodlines or whatever. So we think about those complexities and we use symbolic interactionism in looking at individual to individual social interaction. And then with groups, remember I said we use functionalism, uh, uh, which is structural functionalism as a method in explaining how groups in society interact with each other. And then the last uh, 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 sense uh, that we look at is the global perspective of whole societies. So that is where we look at how uh, countries interact with each other. We can even take it to provincial level to say how different provinces will interact to, with each other within a country. And we use conflict theory for that. We say that all members in society are always in a state of uh, uh, conflict, or competition for resources. And as a result, that is always going to make them fight over resources or, or create some sort of conflict within society. And we say um, that conflict can define how society in the global sense is, is interconnected with each other. Because you'll find that there are countries involved in a trade war with each other. So you see, uh, why are they in a trade war with each other? It's, it's a fight over resources on whatever they are, they, are, they are fighting for. And we can think about xenophobic attacks, taking it back to South Africa. Again, xenophobic attacks are just a reflection of how Africans interact with South Africa as a country uh, in, in the fight for resources. And we say that is the perspective that is used to show how human social interactions uh, apply in the global sense or in the whole societal sense. And we also think about uh, another facet of things, uh, which is looking at the social forces which shape much of human behavior. So now we get to a point to say, okay, so we have established that we have individual to individual interactions. Uh, we have group to group interactions or communities, and we have the global societal interaction. Now we think about what social forces affect how individuals and, and the groups and whole society 
is going to behave in the in the in the broader sense. And what do we look at in the group sense? Again, we can think about uh, how is uh, money as a social force um, affecting how individuals fight with each other. So, for example, you go to Mr. Nyazega, you go and borrow money from his business on from his loan business, and you decide not to pay uh, his money back. So you see, that is interaction number one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you went to Mr. Nyazega to borrow money. Yes, yes. You go to Mr. Nyazega to borrow money. That was an interaction, right? And uh, when you borrowed the money, you promise that I'm bringing it back in a week. A week comes, you do not bring back Mr. Nyazega's money. Now, what is going to happen? We think about the social forces that are going to affect your interaction now with Mr. Nyazega. So what are you going to do? First step, you're going to use social media as a social force affecting your interaction. And what do I mean by that? You, you gonna, Mr. Nyazeg is going to say, a week is, has ended. You haven't returned my cash. Uh, I'm reminding you to return the cash. And then what do you do? You're going to block Mr. Nyazeg on WhatsApp and all platforms. He calls you, you block him. And then Mr. Nyazeg says, OK, uh, I'm going to take it to court. Now we are going to politics as a social institution, you see that. It's going to affect your interaction. So the next time you're going to meet Mr. Nyazega is in court where there is a judge and some people because you're amazing online, right? Yeah, so now that is changing your whole uh, uh, interaction now with Mr. Nyazega. So we can put that in as a social force of some sort, law and order as a social force in affecting your interactions with other people. So that's just one way to put it. You can think about other examples, yes. Unmute. Can you please uh, like try to give us, or oh, me? Uh, okay, good. Can you please try to give us, give us like school related context because I don't think because if I look at that book, we're dealing with a uh, social uh, school, I mean education social law, something like that, right? So I don't understand why these other examples are related to school. I, I mean because because I feel like you should give us okay. examples that are related to school rather than examples that are related to uh <laughs> Yeah. So to answer to answer the question uh, number one, I am I am a guy who is strict on academic integrity. Ne? Yeah, so I'm very strict on that. Defines me, defines the University of the Vet Vatex Run. I'm not gonna give you school examples because you're gonna all of you are gonna go write them in the essay. And then it's gonna be like I conducted a live writing essays for you and I'm gonna be out. I'm not gonna do that. I'm so yeah. So as I said, I'm gonna use, the point of this section is to make you understand content and its application. You are gonna go to the, 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 the Wilson Stridom reading and make, and, and was to study what examples are they talking about in the education context and use, use them uh, to write your essay. Because now you're asking me to give you answers for the essay, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, yeah. So the point guys is, to make you understand the concepts, right? How they interplay. So after you getting the Mr. Nyazega's example, you can apply it in different ways. You can, you can change Mr. Nyazega to a teacher if you want to. So if a teacher, you owe them an assignment, you see. Yeah, so now I'm giving, you see I'm giving answers, mine's, mine's me for, for, for such a yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you see, you see, yeah. So again, again, it goes back to this. Sociology as a study, it is broad, uh, such that in your essay, you can't be strict on, the, on education. Because number one, they did not say, they talk about uh, teachers and stuff in the essay question, right? So you are allowed to make general examples. Yeah, so the name of the book says so, uh, yes. Yeah, the cost peg, that was, it was just the title of a cost peg. Yeah, but you see, you see, you see, now it goes back to this point. If you're gonna do that, 
you, you're going to lose control, Mr. Because you're going to focus on uh, uh, education and teachers and then stop making examples that will make concepts make sense. Because number one, if you focus on school only, uh, 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 you are restricting yourself to showing the applications of how sociology applies to global society. Because school is just a social structure under education as a social institution. So you're not going to be able to talk about whole society, you see? Yeah. Yeah, school is not a society. It's a social structure. That is part of society. It's not a society. Yeah, and again, you were asked to define sociology, right? And remember, before I started, I said, in the first part of the essay, you are allowed to be general because you are looking at sociology in general. In the last part, in showing the interrelatedness of the concepts, you are allowed to use education examples. And what are we doing now? The definition. I can't use education examples because they are restrictive. Are, are you fine? And again, I repeat, I'm not going to give you answers. Yes. A new example, uh, speaking of social forces. Would you say social forces are reasons behind human interactions? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so social force is the reason behind our interactions. So they, in a way, they determine, in a way, they, they tell you why, why will I even go to Mr. Nyaza in the first place, you see. It's because I don't have money. So money as a social force influence why I go and interact with someone else, you see. Yeah, it's the same thing. Again, you are a learner, you don't have knowledge. So you go to a school for the knowledge. So it informs the interactions that will happen within the school. You see, it's, it's still, still the same idea. So you apply it in that case. Okay, and then uh, we also say uh, that the study allows us to look at uh, uh, um, uh, what's this, this, the patterns and trends that exist in society. So it goes back to this. Now that you know how people interact with each other, so you are then, uh, this enables you to then uh, look at what trends exist in their interaction and why are there trends in the first place? Because for example, if people that are in the education institution, you'll expect them to behave more or less the same way. Uh, you see that simply because they are part of one institution that does things in a specific way. While with politicians, you expect them to, to act in a certain way within the politics or government institution, because they are driven by the, the actions. I can hear myself speak, can you mute? Yes, yeah, so they are driven by um, politicians, so they are driven by uh, the, how things are done within that particular institution. So that's what you mean when you say uh, it also studies the, the trends and the patterns that exist within society. And then uh, we, we then look at the forms of collective action uh, that results from these, pattern, from these patterns and trends. So we look at now, so since people act like this within this institution, uh, what, what, what actions would we expect from people under education? What patterns would we expect from people under politics? from people under the economy. So how people will behave then, the collective action of those people will be unique to the institution that they fall under, if you, if you get what I mean. So that's, that's what you explain there. And then we also think about, um, uh, yes, the social processes and the structures. Now, yes, I'm gonna emphasize, it goes back to your, your question. Yeah? Now, a social structure and a social institution are totally different things, but they are related to each other. And let's get that point. And how are they related to each other? You can even phrase it like this. A social structure is a social institution, but a social institution is not a social structure. And what do we mean by that? Social structure looks at the structurization of people within the specific social institution. And what social institutions are we talking about? They are five. We look at education, we look at the economy, we look at politics or government, 
we look at religion, and the last one is family. So those are the five social institutions we talk about. And within these social institutions, we find different social structures. Uh, are we fine with it? Yeah. So later on, when we make examples on how the concepts are interrelated with each other, we will show you what we mean explicitly by a social structure. For example, a school can be considered as a social structure that is under a, a education as a social institution because it focuses on the interactions uh, uh, within or the, the, the arrangement of people under education as a social institution. And you'll know that so education as a social institution has different substructures. You can you have your schools, you have your colleges, you have your um, universities, uh, what else? Tech, Kretsch, yeah, you have Kretsch. So, so you have these different substructures that, fall, that form the education institution, you see. And we are saying that you need to be able to uh, discern or determine what patterns and trends uh, do people have within that particular institution. Um, Noluando, your hand is up. Just a moment. You can. Yes. Noluando and then Chabulani. Um, hello. Firstly, I can't see the screen. Nolando, can you speak all your comments? I'm not going to pause. Da, da, da. Please just say your comment as a whole. I'm going to respond at the end so we save time. Chabulan, you can speak. Um, I'm quite confused about what you said. You said that we don't find, uh, we actually, um, what did you say? I don't remember. I think you said that we find uh, structures in institutions, but then we don't find institutions in structures. You said that, right? Can you please repeat what you said? Hello? Yes, yes, we are listening. Can you speak your entire comment? I'm going to respond at the end. No, I just want you to repeat what you said. I, I have a question. OK, so I said, please don't take my words in the literal. Um, I'm speaking academically right now. A, a social structure is not a social institution. But I said a social institution. Uh, um, oh, I said a social structure. And social institutions, they are started. The social structures and social institutions are the two different concepts. Yeah, let me put it like that. It's concepts, right? There are two different concepts. Yes. It means they mean two different things. But I am now saying for you to understand this, you need to understand that a social structure is not a social institution, but a social institution can be considered as a social structure. And what do I mean by that? I made an example to say, a school is a social structure that falls under the education as an institution. But uh, education as an institution, uh, or if, if you get what I mean, ed education as an institution cannot uh, in a way be defined as a school, if you get what I mean, because there are different uh, fragments of society. So that's what I mean, a social structure uh, is, in that case, a social structure is a so is not a social institution, but social institutions a social structure. So, in as much as a school falls under the institution education, it does not necessarily mean that, uh, in the, in its vastness or complexity, a school can be is, it can be seen as an education institution. 
you get what I mean. So it's a sub institution or substructure under the education institution. Okay, now I get it. You're very clear in your words. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, students that are doing maths, ne? Uh, you, are going, you, are, you are allowed to exercise your HNC. If you want to stay for the essay, you can stay. If you want to go, you can go. Yeah, don't make me make that decision for you. Please, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's think about it. In maths, we have 13 students. In sociology, we have 65 students, plus students that are not in the program that are, joined the, uh, that are joining the session. Must I cancel the whole tutorial for 13 people, uh, which are going to be five in the maths session to start with? Yeah. Why, why is there? Okay, so number one, uh, okay, let's, let's address this. Number one, uh, my program is organized. There is a timetable that says maths is on Tuesdays and Fridays, not Saturday. The only course in my timetable that is on Saturday is what? Sociology. Now the, the team, listen, listen. So the team was unable to conduct a session uh, yesterday, right? And they are conducting it today. And I'm going to make it very apparent to say they did not consult me on the five o'clock slot they chose today. So I am unaware of that. And what, I'm, what the team is aware of is that the program is hosting a special tutorial on writing skills and the assignment, né? which means that it is special in the sense that it is not going to follow the normal tutorial times, which are two hours. It's going to be long. So make your choice or ask your tutors to extend the session to some other time. There is no lack of management. <laughs> there, is, there is, OK, I'm going to repeat what I said. I told the tutors they are fully aware that there is a special tutorial today. They still scheduled a session for five o'clock today. And again, I did not. Yeah, so please address the tutors yourself. There are students who are not in the program waiting for, the, for us to continue. Can we not have the dialogue? Uh, is it clear, people? Yeah, so I'm not going to have an, a dialogue with you. Talk to your tutors. They did not follow protocol. Yes. So exercise your agents in my name. Thank you very much. Okay, so guys, yeah, so to continue, I hope, I hope the, the, the concept on structure and uh, institutions uh, are, are stable. We are fine with that. You know? Okay, so we, we understand the, the two stuff, I guess, people. Are we fine? Yes, no. Head of the table, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm talking, you are talking. Okay, so that's that's what we, we have. Ne? Okay, so let's let's just get to the next fragment of the question. So you are asked to look at how is the study able to study individuals, groups, and even whole societies. So in that part, you need to focus on then the micro, the meso, and the macro sociological perspectives. So that's that's the next part of it. Now, guys, remember, you are not, you are not asked to, uh, uh, you are not asked to tell us what functionalism is about. You are supposed to tell us how the study is able to use, for example, functionalism 
in understanding society. You get the point. Eh? You do not define functionalism, conflict theory, and uh, symbolic interactionism. You generally tell us that in the study of sociology, we have sub theories that assist us in understanding how individuals uh, interact with each other, how groups interact with each other, and how whole societies will interact with each other. So you see, it's, you are descriptive, uh, you are generally descriptive. You don't get to the details to say, functionalism talks about one to be, you, you were not asked that. You were asked what is used in understanding the grouping of society from individuals to groups to, to global society. Yeah, so those are the micro, meso, and uh, uh, macro sociological perspectives. And for you to understand what you'll be talking about, I just have two slides outlining the two. Yeah? So the first one, you are familiar with the slide if you're in the program. So the first one we have is, uh, okay, let's start from the bottom and, and just call them in order. Let's start with micro, meso, and macro. So micro, a micro sociological perspective that we use is called symbolic interactionism. And what does it look at? How does it view society? So it looks at society uh, as a sum of interactions of people and groups. So by people, we mean individuals, right? And groups. And uh, we say that behavior is learned through the interaction with other people. Now, uh, 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 people or students of PSI, someone wrote about Skinner and reinforcement. Can you please note that we are not doing psychology, we are doing sociology. Our sociological theory that is like Skinner, for, that, that looks at behavior of people and interactions. Uh, in, in, we call it in sociology symbolic interactionism. Don't conflict the two sections. You, are da, you, you see, you must forget about psychology when you write this assignment. You, at no point are you supposed to talk about Vygotsky and Bandura, please. And I'm saying this, I read an essay assignment submitted. Someone talked about reinforcement and, 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 and skin. I, I, guys, please stop, please. Like, those are the frustrating things that I said I saw when I was marking your stuff. So uh, take note of this. So we are saying that uh, in a sociological sense, we are saying through interaction between people, people get to learn behavior, people learn to learn how to behave in a certain way. And uh, we, we say that how people define a situation becomes the foundation of how they behave. So within the context of this class, how you define the situation, you define it as academic, right? So that's why you are quiet and listening, facing up, taking notes for some of you. And uh, while some of you define it as a waste of time, maybe that's why they're having mini conferences of their own within a session. So it, it goes back to that, how people view things in a sociological sense determines how they are gonna interact with each other. And we use symbolic interactionism for that. So you just state it generally like that in your essay, don't get to the details. Ne? Okay, and then uh, we have the meso perspective that looks at how do groups of society or communities uh, interact with each other. So it goes back to something we talked about in the previous week. We know that in the South African context, uh, we believe in it takes a village to raise a child, right? So in a way, in the society itself, there is a sense of stability where kids acknowledge that they are kids and others acknowledge they are adults and they have a responsibility to socialize or raise the kids ne? Yeah, and affect what, so in a way this does affect what values are going to be instilled within this community, what morals are going to be instilled in this community. And uh, in that sense, we are able to build a, a community that is uh, in a state of equilibrium. And we call the concept a uh, value consensus. So a, a, a community that is in a state of stability, if you get what I mean. So the functionalist view or the structural functionalist perspective looks at society as one composed of interrelated parts. So I just made an example about the kids inter being interrelated with the parents and the parents being interrelated with each other in a sense that they acknowledge that they have a moral obligation to raise their kids. To take it to a school context, same thing applies. So you look at how uh, um, the, 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 the kids in the school 
interact with the teachers and how the teachers interact with each other to ensure that we have a stable school where the main thing that is being done uh, is education. Yeah? So that's, that's what we look at. We are saying this view allows us to look at how uh, uh, society is structured in, in a way. So we are saying that now, if the stability of society is threatened, uh, we, 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 by certain defunctions in society, then we have to act in such a way that addresses the instability so that things go back to a state of equilibrium. So that's functionalism. So it did assist us in that case. And that is how it assists us in uh, looking at how do groups uh, in society interact uh, with each other or how do com communities interact with each other. Okay, then we have the last one. Uh, okay, before we go to the last one, remember that the, functionals, the functionalist view can be both a macro and a meso perspective. And what do I mean by that? When we are looking at, um, okay, let's compare things. When we're looking at then uh, saying a family, comparing it to um, his respective community, which one is the micro and which one is the macro? Which one is the micro? Then saying, and which one will be the macro then? It's the entire community where then saying a family leads. Do you get the point? So in that case, functionalism can be used in that sense as a macro perspective. If you get what I mean, uh, are we fine, people? So it can be used in that way uh, as, a, as both a macro and a meso, because a meso is just the next, you know, with the mid range uh, perspective between macro and micro. Né? So that's what we mean. So it can be both a meso and a macro perspective. And again, we think about. Yeah, change the Wi Fi, Kumar, don't disturb the signal. Come on. Come on. Okay, yes, so about that. So it goes back to that. Yeah, so you think about it in that way. And then the conflict theory perspective, people, it is purely a macro perspective. Yeah, and why are we, are we saying it's purely a macro perspective? So remember, it's a theory by Karl Marx, and he was looking at uh, the economy. So remember, he was an economist. So he was looking at how does the economy act as a social force in affecting how people interact with each other in the global sense. So remember, the macro perspective even applies, you know, it's a blanket that applies even for individual to individual interaction and, and how they even form global interactions with other people. So that's, that's what we mean. So it says that society is characterized by social inequality, that uh, the social inequality is what we call social stratification. So, uh, and it says that the social life is a struggle uh, for scarce resources. So people are always prone or going to fight for resources. And it says that the social arrangements uh, therefore benefit some groups at the expense of others. So because of these inequalities, some people tend to benefit more than others. And, uh, uh, and, and, and we, we say that is a perspective that assists us in looking at global societies. Okay, so now in terms of questions, again, these questions will assist you to look at, uh, to answer the question, because it, it asks you to say, how is this study able to study individuals, groups, and even whole societies? So it goes back to that. These questions, uh, in a way, give you an answer to the question to say, symbolic interactionism asks these questions or answers these questions. And as a result, we are thus able to uh, show how people uh, interact with each other in that sense. So functionalism, we ask this question, what keeps society functioning smooth? It goes back to what we said. We care about society being in a state of equilibrium ne, or stability. And then we also ask, what are the parts of society and how do they relate to each other? So the parts of the society are the five institutions, ne, education, economy, uh, government, uh, religion and, and, and family. So those are the five institutions that we look at. So those are the five parts of society. And we look at how do these parts interrelate uh, with each other and, uh, uh, and on, on their interrelations with each other, what purpose does each part of society play? So we look at what are the intended functions of that part of society? 
what are the unintended functions uh, and that is what we call latent functions of society and what the functions can arise and how do we address them so that's that's the functionalism perspective then conflict theory uh, looks at uh, we said it's a macro perspective so it looks at the distribution of resources so we say how are wealth and power distributed in society uh, how do people with wealth and power keep them uh, do they oppress certain people uh, do they create certain systems or laws to regulate their wealth so we think about such things the power dynamics in society and then we then ask are the are the groups that get ahead more than others and why do we have these inequalities and then we ask the last question how are society society's resources and opportunities divided and how does it then affect the structurization of people across society so that's the macro perspective on that and with the micro symbolic interactionism looks at uh, individual to individual uh, interrelations so we look at how do people co-create society how do individuals interact with each other to create broader society uh, how does social interaction influence create and sustain human relationships and we also think about uh, do people change behavior from one setting to another uh, if so why so as people become mobile does their identity change that's what we are asking what you, what is on your literacy essay so symbolic interactionism answers that i'm not saying go and write about symbolic interactionism in your that essay i'm just saying it's going to assist you in thinking about your essay over there okay so that's one part of the essay and then the last part really of the second last part of the essay looks at um, the sociological imagination so we look at what the sociological imagination is and uh, the, what agency and structure are and how do they assist or rather how can they be used interconnectedly in trying to explain how society is structured so with sociological imagination you look at this reading yeah? so you are given a chapter from c Wright mills book the book that you see on the screen on the sociological imagination and he defines it as the vivid awareness of the relationship between personal experience and wider society and what do we mean by that so we are saying that uh, if you are as an individual uh, aware of the fact that personal uh, was interpersonal relations uh, do lead to global uh, societal interactions with each uh, with, within people uh, you are applying your sociological imagination and then we, th we then start asking why is it necessary for you to apply it and uh, that is something to think about as you are writing your essay to say uh, the sociological imagination is important because it assists us uh, uh, to uh, explain why things in society happen the way they are why do we have so much public issues why do these public issues affect uh, uh, individuals uh, and in that case they are acting as uh, personal troubles to those individuals and it allows us to look at the interplay between structure and agency right and it also al allows us to understand how does the society's history affect the biography of an individual and uh, what do we look at uh, in the sociological imagination we say social stratification as a social force is what led to the kind of sociological thinking we have and how does that happen so we define social stratification number one as the hierarchical arrangement of large societal groups né? so we say this hierarchy of arrangement of people in society uh, in a way determines how people will act in their respective social groups how people are going to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, be categorized according to their class race gender and age and we say that because of this social stratification, we end up having a lot of problems in society. So you'll see that uh, the, the picture on the right is showing you a third wealth city, right? So it's showing you that we have inequalities, yes, that exist within society. And, uh, and these inequalities are no longer hidden, they are uh, visible to the eye. And we say that in, 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 because of these inequalities, we are thus forced to look at 
Now, how is this inequality affecting the individual and how does it affect groups? How does it affect global societies in that case? Uh, as you can see there. Uh, and on the side, you see a student sleeping on campus. Same thing. You look at, uh, is, is that a problem that is specific to the student or is it a problem that is in broader society? See that? So we say that the perspectives that we looked at allow us to explain such matters and the sociological imagination enables us to explain why these things are like that or rather happen the way they do this. Raise my voice. This is the highest I can go. <laughs> no, I've been speaking from one, like my voice is strange. This is for some in fact. Yeah. Or where earphones on the contact session. Yeah, I, I am sorry. I like my voice is strained. Okay, so we think about such things, uh, people. Yeah? So you apply the sociological imagination in that. Now, remember, we said we think about, we say it's the vivid awareness of the relationship between the personal experience and wider society. So in that case, it introduces us to the concepts that are in your essay. You look at how does structure influence agency and how does agency uh, influence structure as a result. And these are the concepts you need to talk about. So we say this is an important debate, of course, the structure and agency uh, uh, paradigm. Now, we, it is called that. Now, we say that agency is defined as the ability to act independent of structure. Yeah? And we say that structure is the pre-existing social arrangements that shape and constrain behavior. And what do we mean by social arrangements? We mean the social institutions that exist in society. Yeah? So those are the social ar arrangements we have. We say within these social institutions, we have people structured in a certain way. So that's why we are looking at it, not from an institutional basis, but from a structural basis. So we look at how do the structures that people form part of a uh, constrain or, 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 or uh, in a way reinforce their behavior or allow for them to behave in a certain way. And we say that when these people are able to act independent of those constrainers from society, then they are exercising their agency. So that's the interplay between the two. So the diagram on the picture shows, uh, sorry, the picture on the slide shows exactly what we are looking at. So we have a social agent enclosed within a structure, which is a, a, jar, a jar of some sort. And we see that they are trying to come out. So the act of trying to come out of that structure so in a way, remember, this is trying to restrain this person's behavior. So him trying to open this lead and get out, they are exercising their social agents. So that is what we mean by, by, by the two. Okay, so I hope that is clear. And then it, it, it takes us to a, an important question then that we asked. So we asked Ruti, why do students protest? Remember that question. Yeah, and it is largely related to the meals reading that you're gonna do to say um, there gets a point where students lose their resilience and when they lose their resilience or focus in the academics, they are influenced by certain social forces. And we, we look at that and we, and we say that when they then realize that their behavior or their sense of agents being restricted within the education institution, they act in ways that ensures that uh, their views are heard, uh, they, 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 they strive for social change as a result. So it takes us to that. So why do students protest? So now it is a complex topic, of course, as we looked at it earlier on. So remember guys, when you, when you again, this is for next week's session. Yeah? So when you go to your meals reading, when you do it for your essay, you need to approach it with this mind to say students, um, in a way, want education. I mean, they wouldn't be at varsity. Yeah, but when they get to varsity, they get uh, exposed to certain social forces that uh, take away their grit and resilience. Yeah, and as a result, they tend to uh, restrict how they would have um, studied in a more effective manner. So it brings the broad issues, maybe issues with not understanding the curriculum uh, that is taught at universities, issues 
with uh, uh, finances that can also affect the student's resilience. Again, we can think about the complexity of the course. So if it is, <laughs> so if the course is too, the course is too difficult for the student, they may not be able to focus. You see that, so that may take away their resilience in focusing on the course. So that's what we think about. Now, sociologically speaking, so we think about these, the, the interplay between the different concepts. Né? So we think about how does history affect the biography of the individual? And how does the biography of the individual affect social structure being the university itself? See that? So, and we think about the interplay with each other. So when, when, when the history of the student is of a disadvantaged uh, uh, sense, in a way it's gonna affect how the individual is gonna exercise their uh, in a way, the, it's going to affect the biography of the individual. For example, the student on the picture is sleeping on campus and they may not be affording accommodation, may not be affording fees, but you can see that they have what resilience. They want the education. That's why they even sleep on campus so that they are not late for classes. And we say that uh, in the way, what is affecting the, 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 the biography of the student is two things the history of the society, uh, the, the part of the world they are from, and the social structure in the sense that you see that when you start contact classes next year, the university expects you to attend 80% of your classes. Otherwise you don't write final exam, you see. Now you are forced by this social structure to be in classes, yet you do not have accommodation. So what do you do? Your biography is altered. You are forced to sleep on campus. And that is something that now defines you as a student that sleeps on campus. Remember, uh, we, we, define, uh, um, we defined it uh, in a broader sense to say, when we talk about history in, soci in sociology, uh, we are making reference to uh, the historical development of the society that you are for. And we say, we look at how do ancient customs, modes of living, various stages of life within the society uh, actually affect you as an individual. And we said, when you look at social structure, uh, Mr. Sitoumi, we are looking at the distinction in the stable arrangement of uh, social institutions. We're looking at the actual arrangement of people within the social institutions. And we mentioned them there in the definition. So this is something that is from Stuart and Zyman. It's a paraphrase from what uh, he talks about. So you can check it out from that already. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the two. So we think about how does history, how does structure affect the biography or the personal identity of that particular student. Now, looking at the history of the society and structure, we think about uh, this. Now we know that at some point, we had FISMA's fall protests in 2015 and 2016 in South Africa. And that was as a result of the increase in fees uh, uh, in the university institutions. And why did they increase? It's because of the history of the society. So you know that we transitioned to democracy uh, at a point where the government was um, uh, economically strained, you see that. So they had to, redirect funds to other facets of uh, society. In, in, and and they, they didn't prioritize higher education as a result. So hence over the years, fees had to be increased so that universities afford their day-to-day -day functionality and, pay, and paying the staff and offering the services that they offer. So that is that, and you'll remember from the documentary, so now I hope it makes sense, you were told that um, Zuma made an announcement to say that decreasing the subsidy that is given to institutions of higher education. So vice chancellors had no ch uh, choice but to increase fees. So they are still able to uh, live up to the demands that come with the institution. And that is why uh, 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 students ended up uh, protesting. And now how is it connected to your sociological imagination and biography? So one decision from a bigger fraction of society being government affected education as an institution, which affected specific individuals that are from this uh, education institution. And you can say it affected specific families of the students that pay fees for these students that are in the institutions. And wh what does that mean? It means now the students couldn't affect, afford fees and as a result, uh, they are forced again to attend 
classes on contact uh, in a contact basis, and as a result, they can't afford the fees. So they are gonna uh, exercise their agency, act against the structure to try and address the problem. So that is why students um, ended up um, protesting. So in summary, this is what it means. So we are looking at how history affects biography, how the biography or individuals end up affecting social structure and uh, uh, how st social structure uh, in a way in the reverse also affects the individual. And that is what we call the sociological imagination. So you are fully aware of how society in general, uh, sorry, so you are fully aware of the interplay between um, how personal experience or your personal troubles will affect wider society and how a wider society will affect the individual as a result. So that's what we have. So the last part of your question is here. So the last part of your question asks you to show how all of these concepts are interrelated uh, with each other, how are they interconnected. Now, this is summarized again by an extract from uh, the chapter you have from Mills. Né? So he, he shows us that, so he says, when you are in a city of 100,000 people, only one man is unemployed. Uh, we say that is the person's personal taboo. Né? That is what Mills say. And he says that, and uh, the reason for that is to, is to say, the, 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 we, we start judging the character of the individual, we start judging if they have skills or not, because most of the people in the society are employed. And we also think about, are they disregarding immediate opportunities that they have? And uh, the, the, the opposite now is true when you have a population of 50 million employees and 50 million men uh, are unemployed. So we think about now, in that particular society, what range of uh, opportunities do they have? And how are these people going to act uh, as a result? So in that case, you start now applying your sociological imagination in trying to see uh, or analyze the truth. So that's, that's what you do in the last section of the, the, the topic. So you think about how is agency af uh, affecting the structure? How is structure uh, in turn affecting the agents? Uh, how is the society where these agents and structure affecting how the, both the staff and the agents are going to act. We also think about how do um, how how does uh, the, the society's history of that particular society uh, or of, of that particular group of people uh, affect the biographies, which is the individual identity of the people within the society. So we think about the interplay between uh, those aspects. So in the last part of the essay, you can do that. So uh, something that will help you, as I said, is the reading that you had for week number three. So it looks at uh, grit and resilience between, uh, for, for students that are in institutions of higher learning. So you, it's a perfect way to apply how uh, these, these aspects or concepts interrelate with each other. Okay, so now in the context of education, so remember, I just want, I don't want to leave it hanging. So in the context of education, the same quote applies. So uh, if you are in a university of 10,000 students and only one student doesn't afford fees, so we say that is, uh, that is their personal trouble, right? And now uh, we start questioning if the student has certain skills, we mean academic skills, uh, to, are they responsible enough? Are they disregarding immediate uh, opportunities? And when you do the, the, the Wilson and Stridom reading, you'll see that one of the problems we have with higher education is that uh, it is limited because uh, they restrict, we are setting this much applications. Whereas we have so many people in society. So we also think about how does that influence uh, the, the agents and, and how they choose to view education. Because they know that I can study get distinction, but if I don't have funding, then I, I can't make the cut, you see. Those are the dynamics we think about. And then uh, the last part says, but when in a nation of 50 million students um, and uh, only 15 million students, uh, uh, what, what's this? In a, 
population of 50 million students and only 15 million students do not afford fees. And we categorize that as a public issue simply because um, we, we, we now think about what has led to such a big amount of students not affording fees. And we, we then think about how do we address that in a sociological sense. Now it takes us to the last step of your writing. Uh, you have written these points, uh, ordered them in a certain way and answered all the questions. Now we think about uh, the review and edit section of your essay. Now, what do you do there? So there are certain technical requirements for this section. Number one, uh, you need to make sure that your paragraphs are not more than 50, 12 lines. So that's the maximum you can go. Uh, the minimum is six lines. Né? Minimum six lines, maximum 12 lines. So that's, that's, those are the things you look at after you are done writing to say, did I over explain things? Where can I cut? And then uh, another one is that you think about your line spacing. So we don't want the writing that is congested and difficult to read. So you need to, you have your line spacing um, as, as 1.5 and the point, the point must be 12 uh, uh, simply because we want it to be as visible as possible. And in a way it informs again, how much information you include. Yeah, and then with Arial, if you use Arial, they allow you to use 11 because Arial is huge and visible. Yeah, so you can use 11 for Arial. Times uh, New Roman is 12. So those are the standard ones. And then uh, the last one, uh, very important. I, I don't know if they, they mark you down for this, I don't know. But a, I, I think I told PSI students this earlier in the year. So they, you need to distribute your, 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 your text evenly within the margins. So I attached just a, a view of what we mean by that. So if you look at the slide there, you have a section of your Word document. Yeah? That's what we have. Let me just zoom through uh, what we are looking at. So number one, remember we said the font must be 12. We are using Times New Roman. So these are the things you, uh, in a way, in, uh, after you write your whole essay, in case your font change, just quote your entire essay and then go to font, change the font to Times New Roman so that it is uniform throughout. Yeah? And then again on the size, you click on the size uh, option, you change uh, the size over there. Okay, now going back to what I said, now I said you need to distribute your text even there between the margins. Né? So if you look at that, that point in yellow, can we see it? You can see, né? now you see it came with text. We have two types of text there. Uh, the, the text that is at A is, 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 is evenly distributed. So. Uh, the, 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 the text starts at one point, it ends at one point. While with text B, see that your, 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 your sentences are like in a race. Some are forward, some are backward, you see. So those are the things you edit. So you, you, you need to select your entire text and then you click on that, uh, uh, that point that is in yellow for the even distribution of your text. Because uh, you, you might have a disadvantage and have a tutor uh, who has a, a, a mental disorder of not being able to read things that are not aligned. You know about that disorder. Né? So some people need things aligned. So if you, you, your writing is like that, it's gonna frustrate them and you're gonna be out for months. Yeah, so that's, that's, those are some of the things we look at. Yeah, so for example, with PSI students, when they get their as, mock assignments back, you'll realize that I, all of your essays, if, they, if it is marked by me, it will come back aligned because I can't read things that are uh, in a race. Né? Yeah, so just always uh, fix that setting before you write. And then we talked about, uh, okay, line spacing here. So that's the button for line spacing, if you didn't know. So that's the button. Always make sure that you have 1.5. Okay, now do we see the weight paragraph there? You can see it, né? Yeah, and then you have an arrow there at the corner of that section. Can we, can we see? Yeah, so you press that arrow, you're going to see a, some a pop-up of some sort. And then there's a way that you're going to see the weight special there. And then there's going to be a drop box of features. You need to press that and press on hanging for your reference list. So for your references to be aligned in that way, you need to do that. You go to that 
Aero, you, you go to special, you, you drop down the, the options there, and then you press hanging, and you're gonna uh, have your references uh, organized in a proper way, not like paragraphs. Yeah? So that's, 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 that's what I said I will show you uh, later on. So now another important thing, guys, is you need to proofread your work. This is the editing section. Proofread, proofread, and more proofreading. Make sure that you don't submit unproofread work. Very important. And again, before you submit, please contact your, your writing center consultant. I believe everyone is on some group for writing center so that they check your essay. If you are not on it, you have an RAA. So also contact your RAA uh, so they assist you with editing your, your, your work. Uh, and again, you can even contact your peers. Uh, make sure it's a peer that is in another degree né, so they don't copy your work. Uh, contact your peer so they proofread your work and edit your stuff. Okay, so this is a list of references we've had for the session. So I'm done, guys, for today. List of references, uh, just, just so we have it in record. Uh, all the pictures and diagrams that were used in the session, uh, all copyrights uh, belong to the people that created them. They are not the product of Pedagogical Science Institute. So we acknowledge them for that. So can we get questions? Do we have any questions and comments? No questions. Do you have any questions and, or comments? No questions. Do you have comments? Yes. Unmute. Okay, we don't have questions and comments. We are fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you for attending, people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we can leave the session. Thank you. Yes, that is all. All the best for your submissions. Bye.